Yo. Ahoy, crypto pirates. Ahoy. Welcome to your Discord Syndicate. I'm Captain RG3, and we've got my sidekick, my number one man, the main dude, Hex Jesus. What's what? up? Up, my bro. Nothing much. Just ashy as hell, dude. Like, there's uh, there's all these fires right now in California, man. And, dude, I was working in the ash, literally, man. It was this, this entire area. I mean, we were just getting rained on by, like, fire dust, essentially. I'm and heading out. I'm heading out that way tomorrow. I got to go to bad. Santa Barbara. It's, it's real bad. Um, a lot of the nearby areas have been uh, – I was getting calls from customers all day saying they just got evacuated. Wow. Yeah, dude. It's we're on fire again. It, it's apocalypse bingo, dude. It this really state, is. Man. This freaking state, too. I'm being, I'm telling you. It's just <sighs> – anyway. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about better stuff today than the shit that's going on out there. Besides asthma, right? <laughs> <laughs> you got as you got asthma on top of it. Oh no, no, no! It, it was really hard to breathe though. But I had a, um, you know, I had a ventilator mask anyway, so it was fine. But gee, mm -hmm. dude, this is bad, man. I, we had a we had to turn off water for a bunch of properties, just so it wouldn't turn on. The heat yeah. too, man. The heat is freaking crazy out here. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, it was really hot like two days ago, and today was really weird because we're, we're so covered right now in ash. I mean, the the orange. I mean, the the sun doesn't look yellow; it looks like dark pink magenta, and it was actually cold. So it's yeah. it's sort of like it's all it's almost just just before I we jump off this topic, it was almost like like we were going through like a nuclear winter. And the reason they call it nuclear winter is when you have a little bit of smoke in the air it actually makes it hotter, right? It's almost like yeah. you're in a vacuum, but when there's enough smoke covering the sun, then you end up um, getting actual, like the, the temperature was, it was cold all day today, dude. It was, it was crazy. For real. It was cold and windy. Yeah. It's like 100 and freaking 10 where I'm at right now. Lots, I mean, I, well, I, uh, yeah. I had concrete put in yesterday and that mm. shit was dry. Like the dude left three hours later, freaking dry, man. I mean, the yeah. shit's like, completely dry he's like he couldn't believe it it was it was so stinking hot i went outside for a little bit like i i, I changed out the ho a hose on the side of my house with one of them little stretchy freaking hoses supposed to oh, be oh, little, little slink hoses yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was supposed to be cool you know no oh, this thing weighs a freaking ton it, it anyway it, it, it I damn damn near kill myself just working out there in that heat it was it was it was hot man right yeah, it's it's no joke, dude. Like, yeah, I mean, it was bound to happen. I mean, the fi the fires over here, at least over here, two of them were started by um, one was one was started by a camper out in Big Sur. Another one was um, they're they're trying to prosecute. They think he may have started on on purpose. And then the last one was a thunder strike. They hit like a couple houses that started that fire over there in uh, the Los Palmas area, at least where I live. So, so these guys do this shit to get like recognition for what i don't get it yeah well <laughs> I'm freaking I'm to get it. under the bridge but um a couple of times they've caught people if they're being associated with people in the fire department themselves yeah i know that uh i know that sometimes actual you know guys that that join the fire department are that are that you know Whack. I, I remember my when, when uh, my mom and dad lived in a little town in, in Colorado, um, and they had a volunteer fire department. And right. there was like this barn that was over freaking 100 years old and shit. And uh, just so that they can go fight a fire, this freaking dumbass volunteer kid decided to go out there and light the son of a bitch on fire so that they can go out on a call. <laughs> He's like, I'm trying to get a job, man. Like, but, <laughs> but the way the way the uh, firefighters, not to shit on firefighters, but it's really feast because I've got friends and some family that are firefighters, and it's it is feast and famine. So while while there's no fires around, they're not they're not earning that much money. But when there's a fire, they're they could be earning like, I mean, it's like forty five thousand dollars paychecks a month, like like really good really good pay and stuff. You know, if if you do like a couple, two three fires a year, you're making more than a quarter million dollars a year as a firefighter or more. I've never just, heard of that. Yeah, well, it's just over. If you're, you're you're working tons of hours, or you're getting overtime pay and hazard pay and everything like that, and then, um, I'll, at least that's how it was explained to me by my cousin and everybody who's a uh, who's. I think he. Uh, 
I think he was a firefighter earlier for Death Valley for a bit. That's how he got started. And then from there, yeah. he moved over to um, like uh, Carmel uh, Fire. When uh, when I first when I first got out of the Marine Corps, I tried to get to the police department, and, then, and I told them to go take a flying leap. I didn't want to go work Metro. They wanted me to work Metro. So I went into the fire academy. That was the next thing I did. So I went through the whole fire academy over at uh, Rio Hondo and um, completed that. But like back then there was literally like 3000 people trying to get jobs for like 30 jobs and all of, at that time it was Orange County and it was like 30 jobs. And there was 3000 people lined up for two nights at uh, the old Douglas plant off of 405 wrapped around the building, people in their freaking campers and just <laughs> their cars just to get applications. It was Wonder crazy back man. then. Th those that's days are over with, but yeah, that's crazy. It was, it was nuts. That was, that was like in the late eighties, early nineties, way him. the hell the freak back there. But anyway, what is going on in crypto? You got any, any news? Any any more drama? I did you uh, see the uh, did you see the uh, and top shit that was out there? Yeah, uh, hope I mean we'll see, we'll see what ends up happening with that. I mean uh, there there was something pretty interesting. Like Richard was talking to um, Blue Da Vinci or Da Vinci Da Vinci, mm -hmm. and he's an OG he's an OG a guy in the crypto space. He was talking about Bitcoin way back in the day. So he had tons of these videos that he did, and then yeah. at the time, nobody was watching him at all. But then, people, then he stopped making videos for a while, and people discovered his videos, and like all his predictions were right, like everything. Like and people were like, "Holy crap!" And then when he came back, which I think was in um, like early 2019, people were like, "Oh my god, the Messiah came back!" And then, <laughs> and uh, he he got a huge following uh, as soon as he came back. He's doing videos now, and then he ha he had like a really interesting conversation where he was asking like genuine questions. He's like, "I don't understand hex. How how does it work?" And you know, Richard was trying to explain it to him because. Uh, and um, it looks like they might actually do some a video together or maybe a private call for him to understand how Hex works, which is pretty cool. I mean, he, it sounded like he was pretty open to the idea. So, I mean, the guy's a smart guy. I saw somebody else calling him out and said, should I do something with – should I do a stream with the scammer? There was another another guy out there too. There's like, there's like three of them going on right now. Well, I mean, if you're reading a lot of the Coin tele, um, I think it's Coin Telegraph. I think Coin Telegraph articles, they're like – it seemed like every third article hex is in there. If you if you start reading reading into the article, you'll start noticing hex is being mentioned a lot with DeFi and stuff and everything. And then like, I think I think our people are reading these articles and being like, "Yo, yeah, hex is being mentioned a lot." I mean, I mean, P, I mean, everyone know. I mean, hex pretty much started the trend, really. Outside, I mean, like, out. I mean, the first coin to start really paying interest on owning the coin was, I guess, Tezos at first. But the first true DeFi coin was hex. If you look at it that way, you know, so it's it's pretty interesting. And then even even some of this, um, I don't, don't want to say project names, but scam projects that started in Hex. A lot of other projects that really blew up, like something like Yams, were copying things literally word for word. I mean, it was so, it was so crazy. It was almost like they took a page out of the book <laughs> and started doing all this crap. I mean, uh, I posted something over there in the Hex Pro chat last night, and um, dude. You read that and you start and you start thinking of what I'm thinking about right now. You're like, oh, I know where this came from. Mm -hmm. Same play. <laughs> right on, right on. Yeah, yeah. So we uh, we actually have a guest today that we talked about for uh, last. La I talked about last stream. Right. Um, we started to focus a little bit on health, financial, right. spiritual. Um, you know, your, your physical well-being um, and how hexagons and the, and us here on the show, we just want to try and kind of, um, uh, you know, not so much give everybody advice, but maybe put some people on here in the community that uh, actually have some knowledge in those areas, you know? Right. Um, so, so this guy, he's been, he's, a, he's one of the OGs. He's been in the chat room in the telegram chat for a long time. Um, I remember talking to him there and stuff. And, and um, so, so he's been around, he, we've been trying to get him on the show. He's been, he's been having trouble with his, his uh, computer and stuff. And so he's, he's ready to jump on. So I'm going to bring up our, our, uh, one of our OG hexagons, um, hexercise. Hold on a second here. See if we can bring him up. Yeah, there we go. What's up, dude. What's going on, guys? 
Man, good to have you on. Finally, it's been a Thanks. long time coming. We've been we've been chatting for a long time in Telegram, but uh, haven't been able to get you on. Oh yeah, finally, happy to be here, and thanks for having me. This is sweet. Well, right on. Tell us a little bit about yourself, as far as what you do. I mean, the reason you you, you got the name Hexercise, so obviously you've all and, and I've talked to you in chat rooms where you we've we've talked a little bit of um, of uh, physical well being. What is it that you do? Who are you? Yeah. Um. Before I start here, um, is my audio okay, or do you want me to put it in my that yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. Man. Nice. All right. Um, well, I'm really just kind of your average guy into crypto. I love everything about cryptocurrency. I have almost zero technical skills, though. What I do have is a butt ton of formal education in the university system going through uh, kinesiology. So I did my bachelor's of science in exercise science down in Texas. And then I stuck around and I did a master's of science in exercise science down there in Texas. So all of my like real knowledge and real world experience is kind of oriented around health, fitness, nutrition, those kind of departments. I was drawn to crypto a little bit later after I, I originally went down to Texas on a golf scholarship. So I played sports for a while and I was just not enough of a nerd. I used to, I wish I was more of a nerd back in the day because I would have found so much of this shit so much earlier. So finally, I got in somewhere around 2018, the big, the big ass bull run and built a rig. One of my friends got me into it and was introduced to Richard Hart during his uh, discussion with Roger Veer. Thought that was wicked and followed him ever since. Got into Hex day one, FOMO'd in just like everybody, put as much as I'm willing to, to put at stake with Hex. Uh, I like a lot of the crypto space. Obviously, there's a lot of shit going on out there, but um, just think I, I want to be able to give back and help disseminate some of the information I've learned, especially to people in the crypto space. Um, America in general has a huge, huge health problem. And I think the cryptocurrency space might be even more at risk just because of the nature of the job and everything that comes along with that. It's like number one killer in America is heart disease directly directly related to physical activity and nutrition as a byproduct. Diabetes and stroke are also up there in the top 10. So right. directly related lifestyle diseases, which potentially, and I think most likely afflict the cryptocurrency community even more. I think there's just a pretty big barrier to entry. Number one, cost and number two, knowledge. So back when Hex launched, I was actually just quitting golf. So I turned pro and like chased golf for a couple of years. And, and then recently I was trying to figure out what else to like kind of spend my time on or spend my money on. And one of the things was just to start some sort of channel where hopefully I could offer back some of the information that I've spent way too much money learning. I'm not a huge advocate of the universities, but like they can be good. Um, so try and give back some of that information, especially what I think should be straight up free information. If it's going to help your life, improve your quality of life, extend your life, that's like shit that can really, really help people directly. And especially crypto people, like most, most of us are sitting in front of screens for who knows how many hours a day. And stressed out of our fucking brains. Too. Plus, plus stress. Yeah. So Same I'm, I, guess. I just want to do as much as I can to help. Uh, I just dawned on me the other day that I like telegrams way more, way easier to like add, files or programs or links in so i just started a telegram channel if you want to come in there and ask me any questions now take what i have with a grain of salt i've got a master's so i know some stuff but i think i provide a pretty good view on a lot of things i think i have a good a decent enough foundation of knowledge in all the areas to kind of decipher out the bullshit which the fitness industry has a lot of a lot, a lot of a lot of bullshit all the bro science out there, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. and I would love to do that for free. I've been collecting and gathering information for, I don't know, this is 2020. I've been down there, down in the States starting 2012. So I've got resources up the yin yang. I say, so let me see if I can pull them up real quick here. Hold on a second. So I say, so, so I had a, a, a personal trainer for many years. He was, he was a friend of mine and, um, he um, 
he he ha he put me on a path to doing a lot of different types of you know um, the last thing I was working on with him was um, was hit training and because I'm an older guy he he actually helped me with I was I was I was in the gym you know I'm a marine so I learned a certain way how to work out. And so I constantly did that. And I tried to add stuff and, you know, and these type of things. Uh, but as I got older, I started to have shoulder problems, back problems, neck problems, elbow problems, you know, wrist problems, all these start things started to pop up. So what I did was I, I, I finally, I got, I told, started telling his friend about it. And, uh, he said, um, Hey, look, you're, 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 well, I was like 47, 48 at the time. He said, it's time for you to stop doing certain exercises. It's time for you to change your diet. It's time for you to start doing some other things. You know, it's about longevity now for you. It's about taking care of your, like you said, cardiovascular health and those kinds of things. You know, it was mostly spending time in the gym and then just starving myself and doing like radical, like, you know, Atkins type diets where I would just, you know, drop weight and then try and put it back on to gain some more size and that kind of stuff, you know, instead of really looking at the science of it and checking out my body type. But, but anyway, this guy here is, his name was uh, David Kimberly. I don't know if you know who he was, um, but he just passed away last February and uh, an unfortunate freaking tragic event. And, uh, but he was, I mean, he was on muscle and fitness more times than anybody known to man. I mean, the guy was just a freaking, he was a stud, but unfortunately uh, he passed away. So I took a lot of the stuff that I had learned from him and, and have just been kind of expounding on it and trying to gather information from people. But I, what I do know is that everybody's different and, you know, you need to, you need to like work your body type and work your your program as far as what your lifestyle looks like, your stress levels, um, your financial situation. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things that changes the way a person approaches their health. And somebody like you, I mean, you know, the way David did it is he had he had an online training um, facility basically. So he would he would charge people. He would do his own thing. He'd he'd do videos. He'd do he had a website and he had a lot of basic information, diets for people, those kinds of general things. But then he took on clients online and, you know, personally trained folks and, and sat down with them and went over their own personal program. And, uh, and of course, he charged for all that stuff with, with, with his clients. Um, but that might be something you can look into for the Hex community is you can, you know, put out some content, put out you know, the stuff that you know, and then maybe, you know, set up a website that pe people can actually join and, and get some type of a nutritional and a workout regimen program from you. I don't know. Do you do what? Do you do something? Have you ever trained any clients before? Yeah, I talk more, mostly just like personal friends. So I don't have right. a certification by any means, but I haven't really had to go out and pay the money to go take the test. Right. Um, the test that I'm going to take, it's cost about six or seven hundred dollars to take. So until I really need that, I'm probably not going to go get it. Um, so I've trained like brother, sister, and then a couple of friends at like the university that I did the master's program with, and then. Right got hired on there as an instructor eventually after I finished my master's. So my current job is like lecturing for the Department of Health and Human Performance and teaching anatomy and physiology, phys of X, physiology of exercise style courses. But yeah, if the, like if the group had enough of, of a following, that would for sure potentially be a next step. But for now, like I just am down to get whatever, like answer some questions that people want answered. Hopefully, yeah, try and wade through the bullshit so people don't waste their money on shit. I've, I've been there. I've bought the dumb shit. I bought the fat burners. I bought the test boosters when I first, when I was like 20, 21 and first started following like health and fitness on YouTube. And yeah, you just don't need a lot of that shit. Even programs like you programs, you can keep it relatively simple for the most part and people charging you for programs. You can probably find something just as good for free. Right. So if you There's don't like, have the money to pay for it, like that's what's stopping a lot of people from getting started or getting in, like in improving their health. So Yeah. No, there's a lot of information out there. Um, and for, for me, what I found was I just had to, you know, look at a lot of things with a grain of salt and then adjust them for myself. And, and especially diets like, um, 
like running your ma- your macros. I mean, that's like running a macros program is is the best thing that I ever did. I mean, I had to get myself to a, a decent weight first before I, I you know started to benefit from a program like that. But once I did, man, I just felt optimum when I, when I'm running macros and I'm really doing what I'm supposed to eating what I'm supposed to be eating and working the way I'm supposed to be working as far as my workouts go, then uh, I was feeling optimum at that point. But but when you're when you're running around with an extra 25, 20, 30 pounds, you know, you, you got to do something to get that weight off first before you can really get into right. a program that's going to, you know, be beneficial to you. Yeah. Is my opinion right. anyway. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Right. Yeah. Are you the type of guy that likes to like give people like their macro numbers and tell them if it fits your macros sort of sh- sort of stuff or are you more you giving them a specific diet? Um, if they, if they want, so if it comes to one on, like if I, if it's still a big, a big, large group, I'll give them resources where they can get an estimate of where to wow. start with total calories, probably a decent split of where they can start with macros and then kind of go forward from there on their own. If so we have a- before we confuse the hell out of everybody, cause now, now we're going to start getting into some, some technical shit right. Right? Yeah. before we confuse everybody on everything. So so your your macros, for those of you who don't know, are you know basically your body weight and activity level and age um, create a a a, um, a an equation uh, that is going to be e- equal to the amount of intake you need as far as nutrition, calories, uh, fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Um, based upon your goals, if you want to lose weight, gain weight, maintain weight, you're going to adjust that macro level as to how many carbs, how much fat, um, carbs and proteins you'll eat. So you adjust your fats, your carbs and your proteins to fit within your macros to attain your goal on a daily basis. And that is whether you want to gain weight, uh, build muscle, meaning not, you know, gain weight. We can do that easy enough on our own, um, lose weight, um, or, or maintain a performance level. And so that's what a macros program is versus some of these diets are like, you know, Atkins diet, uh, low carb diets. Um, you know, there's all these weird things out there, the Hollywood stuff that, that people are doing on a regular basis. There's always some new diet coming out of Hollywood that, that tells you to, you know, stuff pineapples up your ass or something. I don't know. There's just all these weird things. But um, what I found that really works for people is if you're obese or you're greatly overweight, overweight, then a, a lower carb, um, a lower calorie intake with a higher exercise level as far as your aerobic exercise works to start getting that down. And then once you get to a level that's close to where you want to be, then you set up a macros program is has been, you know, my general um, opinion of how things should be done or, or the safe way or the healthy way to do it anyway. Yeah. So macros is just a term to describe things that are made up of calories. So all of these different diets, they all have slightly different mechanisms, especially if they're trying to get the individual to lose weight, which is the most popular thing that we're trying to do here in America and Canada. And I'm no, like, we're no better than America. Canada's doing the same shit. UK too. <laughs> and UK everywhere, literally every yeah. developed Mexico, country. Shout out. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So calories is what all the diets are based around, and they have some unique mechanism, unique ish to them to try and lower your calorie intake. What a macro is, macro is short for macronutrient, and there are three different macronutrients, each one of those containing different amounts of calories per gram. So you should probably heard of them protein, carbohydrate, and fat. Those are your big three that make up. Uh, all the different food that ultimately gives you energy, calories, and that's what runs your body. So daily, you have what's called a basal metabolic rate, the amount of calories you burn just to live, to sit here, to turn the lights on, right? To run right. The, the fundamental systems, the organs to breathe. That would be your basal, basal metabolic rate. And if you did nothing else all day and you ate enough calories to equal that, then you shouldn't lose weight more or less from day to day. So eventually, once you get to a place, you should be able to find a macronutrient breakdown that's good for you and your activity and your goals, like RG3 is talking about, and optimize from there. And that's the the method that I find most people like the most because it's the most flexible. Um, 
the more drastic ones, usually like Atkins can help you lose weight really, really fast, but it's ultimately through lowering calories almost every single time. Yeah. Yeah. So it, no matter, that's what I've seen all these diets. And as I've looked at all these diets, it's like, well, shit, they're, they're limiting you to, even though they're making you eat this weird shit or whatever, they're limiting you to like 500 calories a day. No wonder you're going to lose weight. Cause yeah. At any diet, I mean, you could eat 500 calories worth of Twinkies a day and you're still going to lose weight. Yeah, I mean, right. You know, or a bucket of freaking lard, you yeah. eat only 500 calories of it a day. You're still going to yeah. lose weight because yeah. those calories are what matters. Hey, somebody wanted to know what is the name of your Telegram channel? It is t.me forward slash hex exercise. All one word. Oh. A little... Hex exercise. Yeah. Throw it, throw it in there. I'll throw it, throw it in the chat, in the private chat there. And I'll, I'll send the link over to, to D live. So everybody gets it. Yeah. So, all right, everybody's starting to bitch and whine and cry. Cause we're not talking about hex enough. So, all right, you little whiny ass little bitches. We will start talking about hex. And now I have somebody else in the green room that I'm going to bring up. That's going to help us to talk a little bit about, and we'll, we'll keep talking about fitness because um, the other guy that's coming on here, um, he's, he's been part of the community for a long time too. Uh, he and I do regular stream. I, I did a stream with him this today. We were talking about, you know, our, our, uh, the, the health of, of our, um, brands and, and what it is that we're doing here, you know, with discourse syndicate and, and the D live thing and all that. So, uh, he's, he's on, on a regular basis, helping people out with their financial health. Uh, you know, and on top of on top of everything, guys, here we're all hexkins. We're all into hex. Uh, we are all. I mean, there's only so much moon boy talk that can go on. There's only so much when when the coin is going sideways that you can talk about. There's only, and we do three sh three shows a week. So well, let's talk about some things that are a little different. But we will we will talk about hex. I'll always bring it around to hex. So quit your fucking sniveling. Hold on, I'm gonna bring up funding Jim right now. What's Ooh. up, Jim? I love the culture of this channel. I love this, uh, this, this, uh, whether it's the F and hangout or it's the, the daily kinds of things, uh, the other two days that he streams always bring, uh, excellent, uh, commentators. And it's good to see Hexercise in person. Uh, I've, I've paid attention to the people that kind of frequently comment and then the ones that first get adopted, obviously when they change their namesake, you know, that they're on board as far as the Hex, uh, product. But, uh, before I get too far, uh, I did want to say on the exercise side, one of my really good friends, uh, an ex-tenant uh, that was here for about five or six months in Silicon Valley, uh, he is the world burpee uh, champ, uh, whatever, the, the record holder for the most burpees within a 24-hour period. And uh, he has been, a, obviously, physiology and all the things you were talking about, about his degrees and stuff like that, he has that education. But he started his own company because he was working for, as uh, basically the uh, staff, uh, for a company, a Silicon Valley company that had about a thousand employees. And he was part of the director of the health program to basically like, you know, they have cafeterias and they have all these other kind of luxuries in a lot of Silicon Valley companies. But again, your liability on your overall insurance for your company based on your employees is better if it's a more fit uh, uh, employee base. So he basically was reducing the overhead of the company by instilling these practices of lowering your calories and being uh, active and things like that for that population. So Cameron, his name's Cameron Dorn. And if you look up, if you just go Google Cameron Dorn, the next word will be burpee because he's the, he, in 2014, I think is when he, he set that record. And I think he still holds it. Pretty sure he does. Um, but what I was getting at is that he started his own company that's called uh, suitcase of courage. Yeah, I think it's called suitcase of courage. And basically he goes and he, he, he signs a contract with a company, a, a parent, whatever, sponsoring company. He vends the service of being there on board for about 30 to 60 days, instills the program, the fitness program for that Silicon Valley company usually, or maybe other companies too. Uh, he came to the Bay Area and he just basically always had business. Um, and I think the last one when he was here was Fujifilm, was, uh, was his sponsor for that time. Uh, he changed their. Uh, uh, he changed a lot about their. Um, they didn't have any program at all, so he installed installed a program, and then he basically, when he's not on a contract for his company, he's riding a a, a bicycle or through the Carpathian Mountains or through like a, you know some kind of a mega two hundred mile bike ride, you know, these kinds of things, 
uh, who's a very interesting person. I would love to connect you potentially directly with him because I like this startup entrepreneurial one to five people kinds of businesses. Um, and I think that there's a lot inside of this community that unlike other crypto rooms, unlike other telegram channel kind of let's talk about and let's, let's, uh, let's praise one particular coin or whatever that's been going for years. I mean, these kinds of things have been going for years. I think that there's a more mature uh, demographic represented, at least the ones that are on screen, the ones that basically put themselves out there uh, inside of our channels. So obviously people like Litecoin, he's a great example of someone that starts up a podcast and he talks about all kinds of things because he likes crypto in general, but he, he also learned the business of uh, sponsoring himself and generating things. Same thing with RG3 that I commented about earlier. And I think Hexercise, that's again, that's a niche inside of this smaller community that um, I, I, my, my, my philosophy over the past month has really shifted toward uh, trying to templatize or uh, provide templates and get people that are curious about Hex because they're involved in these Telegram chat rooms or they make memes or they make videos and stuff like that to uh, facilitate them not having to work at their regular day job, but basically start some kind of home enterprise, some kind of home business, because the world really is shifting this way. All of the places that were creating incredible mind value in the Silicon Valley area are starting to decentralize because they're allowing for remote work and they're allow they're, they're, a lot of things are being facilitated in this time uh, that it wasn't before. You wanted to bring everybody together to kind of keep that IP underneath the same lock and key, but now they are decentralizing because of the COVID issue and things like that. So um, I really want to spend the next year of time, uh, not just focusing on my own interests, but on trying to help this community in general. Uh, if you want advice, then advice is available through all of us. We all have something to add. Um, but if you don't want advice and you want to be participate in this thing, I think uh, we can learn from you. So bring your ideas is kind of my, my thing. And I, I want to be able to help people uh, get that way. So I want to connect you if, you, if possible to uh, Cameron um, and, I, and see how that might go for you. That'd be very cool. I'll look them up. That sounds yeah. Well, the company I like work? the idea of having us having uh, something within the community to to turn to 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 work on fitness. I think it's a it's a great idea to be honest. Yeah. I've always liked it ever since we started talking exercise. We want to have the fittest community in all of crypto, especially since the the whole the whole point of hex is the longer you stake, the more you make. So <laughs> yeah. how do we? the longest we can to make sure we get to those stakes. Uh, that's really yeah. important in this ecosystem. You know what I mean? Until until Cyvive comes up with a pill and a shot for us all to, to extend our lives for right, whatever right. amount of time, which I don't know if that's coming anytime soon, guys, but I'm gonna not I'm gonna bet my next 15 year stake on it. That's for sure. Um so so let me let me answer a couple of things in the um in the tell in the in the chat room. Yeah, yeah. So um yeah, Jim works in the in in the um, medical field, um, and yes, a, a, a burpee is what we used to call in the Marine Corps a bend and thrust. And what you do is you're standing in a standing position, you drop to your hands, you throw your feet back to where you're in a push up position, you bring your legs back up to you, to your chest, you stand back up, and as you're standing up, you jump into the air with your hands up, and then back down onto the floor again, throw your feet back out. So you keep doing those back, and and they will wear your ass out, out. Right. And they do they do that in the Marine Corps uh, as a punishment. They make you do what they call bends and they'll just tell you bend. And then you you sit there and I'm sure Jim's had to do them, too. Uh, yeah. 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 Three and a half years. So, yeah, that's that's the normal thing. Uh, yep. Burpee day. Yeah. Bends and thrusts. So they call them burpees now. But anyway, so. Awesome. I think I, I think that that we got something here. I think maybe that we, we can get exercise um, putting something together and putting us some content together, and then maybe even putting some nutrition plans up there. I, I mean, I don't know if you've got the time for it, but uh, I, I'd surely like to see it within the community. I know there's a lot of stuff out there, um, but I don't know. It's kind of nice having an organic uh, something within the community that we can all kind of, you know, it, it helps to motivate people. Um, 
the community getting involved, you know, and we, we all need to push Richard into making sure he's taking care of his damn self. Did you see the, uh, did you see the tweet that somebody put out today um, with the, it was the Peter McCormick uh, um, interview. Did anybody see that? No. So you, no. <laughs> so somebody made a meme. It was, it was Richard's room and his chair and Peter McCormick up in the corner, like talking to him in, in that, like that stream. Yeah. And, but the person sitting in the, in the chair was that, um, it was, it was like a meme of Richard looking like a, uh, a Simpsons character that the, 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 the big, a big fat guy sitting in the chair, he had a heck shirt on and it was a Simpsons character sitting in versus Richard. So it was like a, it was like a spoof on rich. Got it. Got it. <laughs> Well, he's doing his lift. I mean, he's he's got. I mean, again, he's got these lifting uh, videos. Actually, he's uh, improved quite a bit over the past two years, year and a half, and probably brought his stress level down. Once he got through the launching, the the product launch happening back in December, then obviously, uh, you know, fighting. Uh, I wouldn't even call them dragons. Basically, crushing everybody that comes against them. Basically, uh, yeah. several months, and then now I think he's more. Like I watched half. I've only gotten through half of his recent six-hour stream. But I think he was more zen. I think he was more just uh, still engaging and every rarely kind of, you know, watching little uh, concern troll kinds of stuff on the chat. But otherwise, I thought he was his, his psychology was um, very balanced. It was really great. Yeah. Definitely. It's probably just a matter of diet for him. You know, it's it, it, it does. Look, I mean, he I've seen some of his workout videos, too. So he's. He's throwing some weight, which is probably a little little more than he needs to be throwing. But uh, he needs to he needs to get himself on an eating and an eating regimen, which is that's the hardest thing to do is is to fix that freaking diet, man. <laughs> Did you see that thing on his Instagram where he ran all the way down racing against someone and bounced off and came back? I mean, it was dude. Was, yeah, he moved. He moved. He was moving. <laughs> yeah, he's pretty athletic. Pretty strong, man. <laughs> yeah, you need to be careful with those deadlifts, man. That's how you get fucked up, man. <laughs> Or those heavy, heavy squats. Yeah, those deadlifts will get you, man. Well, I, a guy like me, especially, he, I, I've got eight herniated discs, so I, I don't mess around with my back too much and stay away from the heavy, heavy squats anymore. But uh, stick to the machines, you know. But, yeah. but again, like I said, everybody's different. Everybody's got a different program. Everybody's got a different body style. Everybody's got a different age. So you gotta, you know, you gotta look at it at all those things when you're when you're looking at a workout program, you know. Like I hurt, I hurt my lower back deadlifting, pretty much. I mean, I was I was doing pretty pretty heavy weight for a stupid amount of reps. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, you're not. You're, I don't think you're supposed. to – Well, depends on the person, but like, I don't think you're supposed to be, you're supposed to be doing like three by fives with like six hundred pounds. I don't know if that's such a good idea. Sometimes. <laughs> couple, couple schools of thought. If you're a power lifter, it's probably right. what you need to do. If. Right. Uh, you want to be as physically mobile for as long as you can, then I don't think it's something we need to be doing. But. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you look at you look at some of those guys like Haney and some of those guys that you know body build and and lifted like massively heavy. They're they're all crippled now. They're yeah. literally crippled. They they they're walking with freaking canes trying to get around. You know, and they're still going to the gym, of course, and they're putting their canes down and and throwing up freaking you know one tens and shit and and their shoulders and but they're they they can't walk anymore they're yeah. all they're all their backs are wrecked they've all had four or five surgeries you know um That's you know it's like ronnie coleman's jack dude he's so messed up oh coleman's a mess oh my gosh i saw yeah i watched him taking his grandkids or his kids to school and he's like freaking hobbling along with two canes one on each freaking hand you know yeah. and then uh and then look at we we lost Rich Piana just a you know a year right. and a half ago, you know, and that was because he he wasn't taking care of himself either, you know. He was so, doing recreational drugs along with you know. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, his heart just finally gave out, and uh, well, I don't even know if that was it. It was a really weird situation behind his death. I'm not even sure what they, the the final the outcome was. Thing. What's think, that? I may be confusing him with the other guy that was on the Tosh.0 guy, um, but he was like a, a big bodybuilder. He's a massive bodybuilder guy. I thought it was Piona. Piona. I thought that was a guy. But it was like yeah. a, he went into a, like a spiral of depression if it's the same guy I'm thinking of. No, yeah. no. No, no you're well, talking about the, 
I think we, it was we, heart, it was heart attack. Yeah, yeah, that's what they said. He had a heart attack, fell over, and hit his head. And but I, I think he he died from the heart attack, is what from what I understand. Definitely drugs in the mix. Yeah, that's and how Eddie, yeah. That's how Eddie Guerrero died. He basically had a stroke, and like or a heart attack slash stroke or whatever, and then fell in his bathroom. But he was there for like so many like for basically an hour before someone found him, and then yeah. that was it. You know. Yeah. yeah. The, oh. the chat room is going wild now. Tom Platts is still squatting. Platts yeah. had the biggest freaking legs on the planet, shit, bro. man. That nice. guy's legs are like fucking insane, baseball. man. Insane. I had a buddy and I was in Marine Corps with that just had legs like Platts that just were monsters, monster legs. Um, let's see. Coleman was not overjuiced. He just over no. weight. He he worked out hard. Coleman yeah. was hard, worked out really really hard, um, but yeah, they they just they just broke themselves. You know, they got too into. It. And the other thing that's really dangerous out there right now. I mean, you know, hormones are are the deal. A lot of people are taking hormones. A lot of people are, you know, abusing them. A lot of I don't I don't uh, condone or condemn them. To be honest, um, uh, I know that. At a certain point in a man's life, you know, hormone therapy is not a bad thing. Right. Um, but, uh, you know, when now these guys are fucking with insulin, I mean, they're yeah. actually taking insulin and going into diabetic comas and, and, and it's so dangerous. That shit is so dangerous. Um, I know I, I know steroids got a bad name for a long time. Um, and, and, and there's steroid abuse. Don't get me wrong. Um, but, uh, as far as, you know, there's a lot of legitimate hormone doctors out there that are putting people on, on growth hormone and testosterone and things like that to, to help them, you know, uh, for, for longevity purposes. I know there are a lot of people out there that are that to this day, I mean, they look great and they're on, you know, testosterone therapies. So, right. You know, I mean, if, if I, if I were to, well, you know, this is bro science right here and I got a PhD in bro science. So just for you guys to know, right. Um, like in level of danger, like steroids, if you're taking like a low dose amount just to get you back to baseline level, then you have a little more dangerous, which is a uh, growth hormone, but pretty safe still at low dosages from your doctor. It's insulin. That's like so dangerous that if you don't know what you're doing, you'll kill yourself literally like yeah. And it. Yeah. And then, but there is dangerous too with like growth hormone, because over time it enlarges some of your organs if you're taking like large doses of it over a long period of time. So this is like one reason why these guys also have like weird things with their hearts as well. It's because their their heart is literally like way bigger than it's supposed to be naturally. And like the the uh, a lot of the bodybuilders and their hands are just keep growing and like their feet start growing as well and their heads are like this and stuff. It's all from the growth hormone. Well, it's interesting because you see um, some things get a little bit villainized like hormone use, right? Whether it's testosterone or whether it's doping or whatever for some athletic competition, that's usually where we hear about it, right? Whether it's lifting or some sport or something like at the Olympics. But we also see that I like the world that I live in, that used to live in, that was a lot more liberty. If you wanted to destroy yourself, you had the permission to destroy yourself because this is America. If you want to build yourself up, you had the permission to build yourself up because this is America. It's about opportunity. So you can be a Michael Moore sloth kind of personality as far as your physiology, right? You can have your politics, whatever your politics might be. You can choose your uh, your uh, um, uh, the, the types of things you believe in as far as doctrine or dogma or whatever. I like that about America and I, I celebrate the diversity side of it. Um, so I, I, even though I've been in healthcare for since I was 17, I've been in healthcare since I was 17 and I'm turning 50 in a few weeks, right? So it's been a long time. Uh, in cardiology and um, I used to run hyperbaric chambers, recompressing scuba divers, doing a lot of stuff that deals with physiology. And what I like is if people are informed, reasonably informed, right? Signing a 20 letter, a 20 page informed consent to do research, but not reading any of it, just signing at the bottom doesn't mean you're informed. So if you're in general informed and you say Cheetos and beer every day probably isn't good for your health. Okay, fine. I'm still going to do it. If you are in reasonably informed, you say you probably shouldn't be on testosterone so that you can add body, uh, so you can add muscle mass and you can lift for this particular competition. Okay, I understand that. But I'm in America, I think of myself as in America, I want the liberty. 
even if I say I'm going to shorten my lifespan and I'm only going to live to be 50, um, I might choose that life. Uh, same thing with sloth or any other kinds of things that just basically are terrible for your physiology. So I, t I take a little bit opposite side. I like healthfulness, but I like informed consent, decision and choice about what you're going to do with your life. Exactly. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. That bodybuilding world is where like shit gets really weird and yeah. obviously they look great, but and a, a weird paradigm that a lot of people don't really understand is as you approach peak performance, you start to pull away from health outcomes. You start to get deleterious, like even like athletes that are deemed healthy, right? Even like your track and field athletes, your sprinters, your long distance runners, as they approach peak performance, they're going to sacrifice some aspect of long-term overall health, right? So especially in the bodybuilding world, like insulin is one that yet yeah, one of the scariest things and guys started doing it to try and increase the uptake of glucose into their muscle cells directly following a workout. And people have immediately yeah, gone into a diabetic coma, like RG3 said, sure. and yeah, yeah. Yeah. come out of it. But they say it is the most anabolic steroid out there because it just affects your body like that. I mean, it's like opens everything up and it's like the key and it, these guys, well, they, they think or they know or they do. They're so optimum in their nutrition and their workouts and everything. They right. use that to like, okay, now I'm going to um, – they got all these other supplements and everything else going in. They, they use that insulin to like open everything up so they can just shove all of that stuff into their cells and, and they just get massive gains I out of it. I discovered women that were taking Synthroid basically changing their metabolism. Synthroid mm -hmm. is – when you have uh, a goiter and you basically are, you have hypothyroidism. Um, so basically they're amping up their metabolism, but they're also probably wrecking, they're always going to be on, uh, they, your body will respond to that extra dose by producing less, right? So it's the same thing with insulin, same thing with testosterone. If you, you always hear about some athlete that has tiny uh, balls or whatever, right? Because he's, He's, he's been substituting and over producing, over injecting, and his body responds by not producing it itself. Cool. <clears throat> um, yeah, if crazy. you get it exogenously, you stop making it endogenously. And right. what, yeah. you were talking about, what you're talking about performance earlier is the same thing with the Marine Corps, uh, was in reconnaissance when you would do these tri so trial out, trials. You have to carry 70 to 80 pound rucksacks. You have to go these long distances with all of your gear with you when it's five to seven people. You don't have uh, machinery and equipment, uh, uh, handlers and things like that to bring things to a Ford uh, unit or anything like that. You're basically, everything you, you need, you need to carry on your back. So if you're a bodybuilder and you're like a 250, you know, big muscle muscle man kind of mountain of a guy, you're not really gonna make it. Uh, you're, you, one, you won't be able to go the uh, endurance uh, of uh, long, long uh, humps and stuff like that to, to get the gear there. Um, so it's really about the purpose. You know, what is your purpose? If your purpose physiologically is to be an ultra marathoner, those guys are always like skinny as rails. I mean, they're not very heavy people. And right. they either metabolically, they already have the physiology that they are, uh, their lactic acids and things like that are being cleared out of their system quicker. Uh, there's a guy actually not far from me. He's... Um, in Marin, I believe. And by the way, even though Southern California is on, on fire, so is Northern California. Uh, right <laughs> now in uh, Napa and Vacaville, it's all on fire. The entire area is all ash and smoke. <clears throat> right. But um, what I was going to say is that this ultra marathoner, if you look on uh, YouTube, there's all kinds of like, uh, not even on YouTube, like on TV shows and stuff like that. There was a guy that was like, he was like 35, 37 years old. He was, uh, he had just gotten fired. He went to a bar. He got drunk enough to where he decided he probably shouldn't drive home and kind of like Forrest Gump, he decided he'll just like run home. It was like uh, 11 or 12 at night and he decided I'll just run home. Right. And uh, when he started running kind of again, like this Forrest Gump kind of a similarity, he said, Oh, I'm not tired. I'll just keep running. And he discovered at 37 that his, um, and he never had been a runner, never had an interest in it. He just did it basically because of the utility of getting home and yeah. discovered that, he had no tiredness, zero tiredness. And his lactic acid, they've done all kinds of physiological research on him because he runs to a marathon, completes a marathon, and then runs to the next marathon in the same day. So he does like 100-mile runs, you know, hmm. 
with yeah. his physiology naturally just clearing all of those systems. So as long as he's got calories and hydration, he just keeps going. Um, and it's amazing because someone like that, you would say, man, they'd be just great in the Olympics. But what is that? What is competition in the Olympics if you have uh, some people that just are going to have uh, faster twitch, was it like twitch muscles or something like that? Mm -hmm. Fast twitch muscles and slow twitch. So some people are going to be amazing in certain athletic endeavors and some people aren't. So where does that balance come, right? So if you're going to take a an enhancement, but that enhancement brings you up to someone else whose natural physiology has them already at that level, what does right. enhancement mean, you know? Yeah. Then it's personal choice at that point, you know? I mean, unless you're in competitions and you're optimum training, I mean, all of that stuff, really a lot of the, a lot of the steroid use that's out there today is just falling on, you know, deaf ears because a lot of these people don't even know how to use it or why they're using it, or they're just using it because everybody's using it and they want to get some size and, you know, and it, it swells them up because they retain some water and everything. They think they're getting big. Um, but a lot of people don't even know how to use them, you know, and they're, they're for optimum. They're from optimizing your body. Once you're, once you're down to, you know, 12, 11, 10% body fat, and you want to get to that seven, eight, 9% body fat, you know, that's what they're really used for and, and maintain muscle mass and, and gain some strength. So you can lift a little harder than the guy that's lifting harder than you, you know, that's, really what they're for i mean other than other than testosterone treatments or like you said human growth hormone treatments which are actually for later on in life when you when your body starts to stop producing these things and and you know i've done a lot of studying and reading myself and i don't want to get into too many conspiracy theories myself because i try and stay away from that right. but i know that um today's men who were living longer, of course, now uh, tomorrow I'll be 53 years freaking old. So we're, we're living longer than our, our ancestors. And we are also putting things in our diet that are, you know, quite possibly lowering our testosterone levels because a lot of the, you know, pesticides that are sprayed on our foods aren't kill, to kill pets, pests. They don't kill pests. They don't spray pesticides to kill the pests. What they do is they spray the pesticides to kill the male um, reproductive organs in the past so that they can't reproduce anymore. That's what pesticides do is kill male reproductive organs. So we're getting all this stuff on our, on our food and in our, in our soil and in our, in our water systems and all this stuff and all of this shit we're consuming, uh, you know, and it's been, it's been decade after decade after decade of this stuff piling up on in our food supplies in our our cows you know eat the 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 the, the wheat and the and the and the and the grasses that grow from the water that's spreading this shit around and all of this stuff so so it's in our meat it's in our veggies it's in our in the in our food supply in our water so i think that the you know slowly but surely as the years have gone on us older guys as we're getting older and older our testosterone levels are lowering anyway and then all this other stuff isn't helping any so you know i think that um you know that testosterone treatments if you're if you're older you know 30 in your late 30s 40s and you're starting to take testosterone tests that are dropping you down in the hundreds and whatever then maybe it's time to sit down with a hormone therapist and, and figure out where you know, you should be. But as far as all the other stuff, it's just for optimum performance and on the highest levels of, of uh, you know, competitions and stuff. Well, it's kind of weird because uh, not in every case, certainly people want to accomplish certain things and physically, physically being able to do that. Like they say, they want to go to uh, the top of Everest or they want to be a, a scuba diver because they enjoy being under the water. You need to have certain physicality to main, to do these things, right? To to uh, whether it's competition or not. Um, and my position is that most of this stuff, I would say, like ninety percent of our why we care is for our perception by other people, because right. you want to look masculine to other masculine personalities or people or whatever. Because it honestly, it it, it is a opening of a doorway basically to uh influence groups of people if you have a, a, a good physicality to you and you have a stage presence a gravitas not just of your voice and your intellect but your physicality 
you're going to basically influence math, potentially masses. It depends on what you do with it. But also you actually have more access to female, uh, you know, um, I don't know, more access to females in general, right? And more, males. Don't forget males too. Solicit, yeah, so you can solicit the party the team we want to play on. Um, right. But what I'm saying is we do 90% of that not because I want to be healthy. Honestly, I really don't think that most people do it because they want to be healthy. They just want to be attractive. If they want exactly. to be attractive, then that's fine because that helps their economics. They might be able to get into a, uh, a company and might get a promotion, not because they, um, you know, they've got 20 inch biceps, but because they just basically have a stage presence, a, a social status presence. Yeah, and right. that does, we already see that all the time in females. We see that right now, the people that, you know, I, I know so many people that have gotten some kind of uh, injection or some kind of implant or whatever, because they see on their side, what is femininity and their femininity is between their competition, whatever they see their competition as being of a, of a feminine character. So we do these things, you know, you would say, well, if you're gonna get lip injections, is that because you wanna be uh, healthier? No. Uh, what about uh, boob and and, uh, and ass and, uh, implants? Is that because you want to be healthier? No, I just want better status. Men right. we like to say that it's physicality. We want to beat each other up in the back alley. It's really not most of us. Most of us just want to be attractive. It's a competition, man. It was sexual marketplace. Yeah. yeah. And That's then, too, like, the better. Yeah, I mean, it's so true. The better looking you are, the not saying that it's, it's going to be easy, not saying that you don't have to do work, but it makes it a little bit easier or, or people give you a shot. Just because, I mean, and How that's many really, problem. really good looking comedians. Do you know? I mean, really good looking. Like you'd be like, "Fuck that guy! He should be in a magazine." Almost mm -hmm. none. Almost they none. All yeah. have to polish themselves socially and character. Get comedy. Comedy is big influence with females and males, as right. far as being able to, uh, you know, get together a hunting party, get together, uh, and we're going to go do something, uh, you know, to accomplish a particular goal. Uh, so you're either doing it through comedy through intellect because you design a better product or you innovate in some way, you just break through uh, and you, um, or you, you do it through um, physicality. And we're kind of, in certain countries, we're still kind of a physical world, but most, most of the United States isn't as much of a physical interaction world as it used to be. Yeah. Let me answer a couple questions in the chat room. Um, thank, first of all, thanks guys for the, the ice creams and the lemons. You guys are awesome. Always helping us out here. Um, grow the show. Uh, but somebody asked, um, how much can you really increase your testosterone naturally? So I'm going to give my quick answer and then I'm going to let exercise dive into it. No. So, so naturally it's, it, it, it has to do with your age, first of all. Um, and, and not necessarily your age, but your body type. And, and, you know, if, if you're feeling like your your maybe, um, your hormones are low or your testosterone is low, then go get tested and see where you're at. But naturally, I think the most important things are diet and exercise and keeping your fat low. Uh, if you have a, a high amount of fat, I think that that helps, um, the estrogen take effect in your body. Um, and also what you're eating, how you're eating and uh, how you're working out. Um, I know that, uh, you know, working out um, a, a little harder t tends to help people build their testosterone or working out a little heavier, or maybe not just doing aerobic type exercise, but actually getting into the gym and, and throwing some weights around uh, properly. <laughs> but uh, there, there's not a whole lot that you can do to naturally uh, increase like a lowered testosterone. Uh, but diet exercise is, is probably your best way. All those supplements, I think, are just masturbation for your body. It's just you're spending a bunch of money on shit that really isn't helping you. Unless you're really getting testosterone from a hormone therapist and you're using like bioidentical testosterone or the um, – and I'm not talking about getting your Bitcoin and sending it to Russia and getting yourself some some freaking, you know, testosterone junk. I'm talking about a real hormone therapist put, getting bioidentical testosterone for you or whatever and working on your numbers and helping you get to an optimum level. I'm not talking about bro science shit where you're just sticking it in yourself. Um, but anyway, that's my quick answer. Uh, exercise, you got, you got something else to add to that or tell me I'm out of my freaking mind. I think a lot of what you're saying probably stands true. Um, tough question to answer in just one way. So I'll try my best, but in general, like if you're in a healthy state, 
we probably can't like significantly increase it quote unquote naturally, whatever. I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, but um, if you are in a healthy state and you have low tests, that's probably just something that you're dealing with. And if you believe that's the case, then I a hundred percent recommend go get a test. If they deem you have low testosterone, get on some testosterone. What follow what they have to say, but it, there would be lots of cases where your testosterone could be depressed for certain conditions or certain reasons. One of those big reasons that RG3 mentioned was the fat content in your diet. So one of the diets that people oftentimes join when they're trying to lose weight is a low fat diet and not right. that it's a bad diet or anything, but if you go too low in fat, a lot of your hormones are made up of a fat, a glycerol backbone, which you derive from your fats that you need to get. Cholesterol, right? Yeah, cholesterol. So if you're not getting fat in your diet, you're not going to have enough resources to build a lot of these really important hormones like testosterone, like estrogen. So if fat is too low, absolutely your test can go down. So lots of individuals that we see really, really low test in are your bodybuilders who are stepping on stage at really, really low body fat levels. Their test is usually super low. Now it will come back up as their, as their calories come back up, as their fat comes back up, as their mass comes back up. So that would be one case where you could definitely change it just through diet naturally. Another case that would have, again, I would say like fairly significant, but like I would call it like statistically significant, not like a really big deal, um, is if you increase your muscle mass, right? If you increase your muscle mass through weightlifting, you're going to have more androgen receptors. Testosterone is an androgen. You'll most likely produce more hormone, more testosterone for that increase in receptor count. So statist like significantly, we can probably derive some statistical significance through some data mining stuff, right? So lots of the shit that you see in test boosters, I've never gone and actually looked at the, those research studies, but they always claim that they found statistical significance here with yohimabine extract or green tea leaves or jasmine root, this and all this shit, right? So there's they probably have one study with an N of whatever, two, where they found like some statistical significance. But so naturally, if you're at already some uh, met some certain conditions that might have your testosterone depressed, then absolutely you can get it back up naturally and significantly. But if you're naturally low test, that might just be something you, you have to go figure out. Right. Nice. I, I want to answer one more question in the in the chat chat room here. Um, it says, uh, uh, what are your thoughts on the ketogenic diet and ketosis? So I've, I've got a pretty deep thought about that because I did a lot of keto diets in the past. Um, I was uh, uh, involved in keto, ketogenic products, uh, keto salts uh, in, with a company that I was, I was involved with where we actually distributed those. Um, so I, I understand ketosis and what it means and what it means, uh, what sugar means to your body. So that's something else we can kind of talk about too during this. But here's my opinion. Um, ketosis works. I mean, it works. It's really good for your body, especially if you're an overweight person. Uh, I think that if you're obese, uh, if you're, you're morbidly obese, I think ketosis is the perfect place for you to be until you can get yourself to a proper level. Um, now, there's two ways to do that. Um, there's a virtual starving of yourself, which is the Atkins way. And then a lot of people do Atkins wrong. They say, well, I'm going to eat cheese and freaking, you know, sausage and basically just bacon and, and whatever. And I'm going to put myself into ketosis this way. And it works, but I don't think it's the most healthy way for you to do uh, a keto diet. Um, then there's another way to do it, which I really enjoy. And, and it's a practice that I do on a regular basis. And that is, uh, fasting. So I intermittent fast. So 16 hours a day, I don't eat, uh, right now I am not in a fast, <laughs> but, um, on a regular basis, I, I, I'm usually on a 16 hour fast and then I run my macros. I'm, I'm, I'm eating a macros diet for the, the my eating hours. And that's where I feel the most healthy. That's where I feel the most gains, the most losses. Uh, that's where my body feels feels comfortable is doing an intermittent fast along with running my macros properly uh, and, and having a balanced diet, my, my fats, my carbs, and my proteins. Um, so that's that's my opinion on, on ketosis. I know that it's really good. I know there's a lot of other uh, benefits that you get from ketosis because of what it does for your brain. 
and how it, um, in, instead of using um, sugar, you see your brain operates on, on sugar, glucose. And there's two ways for you to get that. Uh, you can get it through throwing sugar in your body, um, which is, think of that as like um, uh, nitrous. It's like, boom, right there, your body sucks it in, and, and, and there you go. And it's brain food. Um, but ketosis, burning of your fat, um, also does that and, and puts the, the, the proper nutrients for your brain uh, in a better way. And there, there, there are studies out there, and again, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories, but they're saying that, that uh, your body running on sugar versus you know, glucose from, from ketosis, um, your body running on pure sugar uh, tends to leave like a, a bad exhaust almost, like a burned exhaust in your brain. And you, that's where they're seeing a lot of these um, brain issues in, and brain fog, and they call it, and all this is from this unburnt kind of sugar that, that your body is, is utilizing for, for fuel for your brain uh, versus actual ketosis, the burning of your, of your fat in your own body's natural way of creating it. So that, that's my opinion and, and kind of what I've learned and understood, but I'll let exercise, you know, dip into that too. Sure. Um so I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to when you say that <laughs> exhaust. Um, and I wouldn't even go so far as to say one is better than the other. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm a proponent of the ketogenic diet, but I'm also not against it. If it works for the individual, I'm all for it. You just need to be aware of its pros and its cons. So some of the big pros we have seen and some of the stuff that's been put is it's really good for certain conditions like narcolepsy. Narcolepsy, there's a carb obligate cell that if you have more carbs in your system, you are more likely to go into some sort of narcoleptic, or not narcolepsy, sorry, um, seizures. Um, epilepsy. Epilepsy, epilepsy. Sorry, not narcolepsy. If you are epileptic and you have a lot of carbs all running through your bloodstream, oftentimes you are more likely to run into seizures than if you're in ketosis. So that is a condition that is 100% applicable. And we've also seen some cancers that are carb obligate, but they're not all cancers are really, really tricky one because it can also switch. It can also not be carb obligate. So certain cancers, it might be beneficial in general. I think it's a really, really good diet because I've like, I've tried it and I think it's really pretty easy to adhere to as long as you can stay away from the carbs. So I think the true keto diet and really the only way that you can tell if you're in ketosis, you need to like actually take a blood drop. You need to prick your blood is I think they recommend 20 grams or carb of carbs or less per day. And if you don't know how much that is, it's not a lot. It's like <laughs> it's thinking nothing. <laughs> like a quarter of a banana, maybe, or a quarter of an or a half an apple, maybe less. Something like that. It's not a lot of carbs. And that gets you to a state where your body will run off of ketones. So ketones is kind of ketones, that's what I was talking for. Oh, yeah. fuel that your body can use in the absence of carbohydrate or blood glucose. Now, like RG3 said, your brain is carb obligate. And no matter what, no matter who, no matter when, if you have sure, yeah. zero carbs, you're still going to create, you will go through a process called gluconeogenesis. You'll create a carb and then you will send it to your brain. So I'm not exactly sure what the leftover exhaust is that you're referring to, but I have heard anecdotally some people say, I feel much clearer when I don't eat carbs. Yeah. Lots of times when you eat carbs, most people, not all people, tend to overeat them and they eat a lot of them at once. So I'll right. send you, I'll send you an article um, about uh, there's some peer reviewed studies sure. uh, that show the difference between burning uh, ketones versus uh, blood glu glucose, sure. um, which is, uh, they, and they, they're, they're finding this um, th some of these brain uh, maladies, these later, these later in life, like uh, Alzheimer's and those types of things are all starting to show some type of a residue that they're thinking is coming from uh, the burning of glucose rather than the burning of ketones. Right. Interesting. Yeah. And, it, and they've been looking at some of these studies and stuff saying that this might be like a, um, a different type of it's like diabetes type three exactly almost. that's what they call it really, diabetes work, type well, yeah three. yeah i've heard it called that too yeah yeah which is like basically starting up like you're getting old yeah. timers 
essentially, or dementia, because you're you're creating some kind of an insulin, uh, some sort of an inf an, an insulin uh, buildup or something like that. Like your 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 sensitivity is really low, where you need to take in a lot of sugar in order to raise your insulin, essentially, and it's it's affecting the brain somehow, where like you can't really remember stuff anymore. But th that's it's they still haven't proved it yet, but that's what they're they're kind of believing it's going on in the brain. Oh, yeah. It has something to do with sugar or like raw sugar, I guess, because I maybe back in the day, well, the way we, we processed sugar was just all through actual carbs and basically um, eating of meat and everything like that. So the, the sugar would hit you way, which way uh, slower because of all the fiber inside of like fruit and everything as well. Yeah, insulin now. spikes are like one of the yeah. main causes of going into pre diabetes is, right. uh, you know, massive insulin spikes and. Approach is you know our just we survived to a point of civilization whatever that was that got us to a point of being able to cultivate crop and cultivate stock and things like that we got to that point as hunter gatherers we assume right, right. and uh, you didn't find uh, uh, easy access to carbs you just didn't um, you, you found more access to animals we were more carnivore probably omnivore yeah. You know what we found was opportunity when we found something to eat on a tree we ate that and we didn't then we kept on walking until we found something else right yeah so, right well it, alaska natives live on you know well fat for half the year you know yeah. and they, well, they you didn't know. have any they didn't have any trees of anything out there to, to well, eat if you go the further ground. back the 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 native uh Ala the eskimos and such you're talking about the inuits and such they were yeah. chinese you know they came across the bering strait and you, uh, 30,000 years ago. So it depends on how far back you say in context. Now, now they might be a McDonald's or Burger King fans. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Well, like the, for, so for instance, um, Navajo nation, uh, they just recently over the last couple of hundred years have been introduced to refined sugars and they, their, their diets weren't used to it on the Navajo reservation. They literally have a 90% um, diabetes rate at this well, point. It's, it's bad. True. I mean, and again, the, the alcohol access, if you look at European and South and uh, uh, Chinese or Asian influence, they had access to alcohol. They call, they they basically did wines or beers or uh, sakes and things like that. Uh, but I don't know that many native, I mean, it was native American or native first nation people, however you want to address it, that uh, did any type of fermentation. Do you know something? I know you're a tribal. Uh, no. You do anything about those fermentations? No, there wasn't. There wasn't any 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 so type. So like of, the alcoholism uh, rate is incredibly high. The diabetes rate is incredibly high uh, yeah. because physiology. If you think about a fork, the physiology from uh, being Chinese thirty thousand years ago and then migrating down across the Americas and down into South America as Indians, different tribes. They really didn't have the. They they lost. I think that. Uh, that uh, processing of alcohol. I'm part right. Cherokee, and I used to get drunk uh, off of oranges that were just overripe as a little kid, I accidentally. You know, so I'm I'm very sensitive to alcohol. Right. Yeah. Yep. I'm 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 straight up allergic. I cannot drink it. I'm allergic. I, yeah, I, I break out in handcuffs whenever I get drunk, so I got to stay <laughs> away from that shit. <laughs> break out in handcuffs. Yeah. I like. <laughs> Yeah, there is, there is something to say where maybe it's like um, like epigenetics or something, where um, a culture that drinks a lot of alcohol over time starts creating sort of a um, like resistance to it genetically or something. I don't know. They're like they're starting to prove a lot of the epigenetic stuff. Like if, let's just say your great great grandfather was a bodybuilder and his son was a bodybuilder and his son's a bodybuilder. There's a really good chance that you're if, when you're born, even if you don't lift weights, you'll have an above average physique just based off your genetics. It's almost like you're pre-selecting your your genes or something, or turning genes on, and then yeah. passing it off to your son, which is pretty crazy because they're saying like, depending on the physique of the, uh, they have to, well, probably because this is kind of reverse sexism right here, where like, they're kind of sexist. Uh, they're they're, they be, they're sexist towards men in studies, but they're very unsexist towards women, right? They're, so they're saying men's physique at the time of conception is really, it, let's just say you're really fat when you get a girl pregnant, you're more likely to make that child more obese because that you're kind of almost like a photocopy of yourself and your sperm when you end up getting a woman pregnant. But if you're really in shape, you end up giving a better chance of your, of your son or your daughter being really good in shape 
depending on the genes you're expressing at the time of when you like get your wife or um, the girl you're messing around with pregnant. But I'd never see the, the reverse study on the female, but you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Genetics is a crazy you poor victimized male. You bro. No. <laughs> like, there, there is that shit. Like they're so there's the tiptoe around the whole girl thing. No, oh, no, no, no. We can't, we can't tell females to get in shape. No, that's terrible. That's, that's, that's feminism. That's the sexist, you know? Can't do that, you know. Yeah, really? I, you know, I know that that's a politically charged thing to say about sexism and feminism, and you know, what's the male version? Like when you say feminist, what's the other thing you're supposed to say if you're a if you're like pro male? What is that? I've asked oh, this before. I never got an answer. Just warriors yeah. basically come up with like feminism. Activists. They don't talk about the maleism. What is it? <laughs> but and, and then people talk about like the uh, the the unfair body standards. Do you, do you see like some of the stuff like how uh, anyone that's ever gotten a six pack knows how hard it is to keep a six pack? It is not easy without drugs. It's yeah, hell no, not even with drugs. It's freaking hard as hell, dude. It's well, I, I mean, when you're younger, it's in the refrigerator. It's easier to get to that way. Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, yeah, like um, I remember. Reading, well, I wish I could remember what these studies are, but I mean, <laughs> I, I've, I've read. Hey, huh. hey, Mama Rock just said that. Hey guys, we raided your ass tonight. So she, <laughs> Mama Rock came in. Hey, hey, Mama yeah. Rock, thanks for for coming in, and thanks for the thanks ninja guinea uh, and the ice cream. She uh, raids because she's uh, one of these crossover, um, you know, people are really to learn from. She's she's got a great channel. Yeah, she does. Yeah, she does. Right. I got to I got to I. The only problem is every time she's on, I'm always busy or working or doing something. Um, I miss, I miss a lot of her shows. Yeah. I've seen one or two. I saw that one where the, you guys were like listening to the, to the voice box, I think, or like the, um, you know what I'm talking about? Like you hear some of the white noise. That was pretty cool. <laughs> oh, the, the word that somebody said that you were looking for is chauvinist. <laughs> yeah. See, why, why would it be feminist versus chauvinist? Do we say, I mean, why male, female, uh, masculine and feminine? Why chauvinist? I don't, I don't change in the logic, you know, it's part of that. Or misa isn't it misogynist? Uh, no, that's uh, about guy, and it's about G Y N is getting. Uh, uh, it's, it's like uh, misogynism down on on, fem on people that have a, a vagina because gyno oh. it's misogyny, you know. So it's the gyno. I don't know. I don't, I'm married, so I don't even buy into any of it. Well, yeah. I, I gave up all my manhood a long time ago when I put that I ring on. This oh. A little bit earlier today in the Telegram, and it was about um, uh, people were saying, why Richard this? Why whatever? Why is this gate? You know, they were going through the same thing you hear over and over. And part of my belief is uh, social justice warrior personalities don't like the very uh, – gun and uh, masculine kind of alpha persona that Richard, he's abrasive to people in general sometimes. Uh, and I don't think he does it purposefully. Well, sometimes he does do it purposefully. But um, a lot of Silicon Valley is more of a, uh, I wouldn't say that they're right, but they're very leftist. And because they're extremely leftist, it is um, different, different altogether. So they're the ones that will end up saying feminism, I'm a feminist, I'm a, you know, whatever, as far as the left side of things. And they really don't announce their, uh, their conservatism. They really don't do that here at all. Um, yeah. So I see some gatekeeping, not because of the product, but because of the person that's uh, attributed to. I don't know. I've, I've always heard stuff about like, you know, Silicon Valley and stuff. The reason that they, they, it's almost like, like they use that to protect the company in a way. We're like, oh, we're we're you know we're pro woman, which is like awesome. You know, I'm not I'm not saying not be pro woman or anything like that, but like it's more of a fake pro woman. It's more like we're we're pro woman so we can protect our bottom line so we don't get attacked. So it's a fake, it's a fake, it's a fakeness. It's not real. It's like we put we have a female CEO, so we can get away with more fuckery if we have a woman in charge. But the board is what really rough, who's really controlling the strings. It's 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 a it's a facade basically. It's like you see like look the, the other day we just sent you know we just donated to a lot of underprivileged kids. You don't give a fuck about underprivileged kids. They're like Wait, it's a, it's all about optics when it comes to that shit. You know. Well, you're seeing and actually like, companies losing dollars and they're losing dollars. Right. Some of them are losing dollars because people become an act. They're they get hired into a position or transfer into a position, 
and then the the company culture gets shifted in some way like gillette gillette having their uh you know a toxic masculinity kind of thing they were supposed to be selling razors right what they've been promoting for 30 or 40 years is about the masculine character but right. that's not good enough uh so now you're seeing that their sales have plummeted i mean plummeted through the floor yeah. when they released that whole ad campaign program and that was brought basically by new, relatively new hires that got this woke thing. So recently, uh, it's all over the, the social media platforms and things like that, all the commentators are talking about a, uh, a hiring platform that's called Unwoke. And basically on Unwoke, basically <gasps> you put your resume and you put your resume and say, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not with that crowd. Like I, I just want about the success of the company. I just want to, I want to be, you know, uh, get things done. You know, it's almost like a, let's, let's take that hill, you know, kind of yeah. instead of hire me so that we can change the character and the perception to the public of the company that has survived a hundred years, but soon after probably won't once I'm in. <laughs> once but, I'm in right. but the <laughs> other thing we got to remember is, is that these are companies. They're not right. human beings. They're, they're company. Yeah. They're run by humans, but they're companies that have their own kind of, like you said, like their, their own personas. They're, they're, you know, they're masculine, feminine until that gets changed. Well, if it's a, things are changing. Really things, the market, then the public is the consumer is the one that decides with their dollar. Of course. The of course. With their dollar. However, there has been more of a socialist move in general, meaning that government through taxation subsidizes companies that still promote a, uh, an agenda, right? A political agenda. We support this particular candidate and because we support this candidate, then that candidate is going to basically a quick pro 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 support. Yeah, our that's lobby powers. Yeah, it's all lobby power stuff. It's so lobby when, power, when which is how our government is run. Yeah. Yeah. and his story yeah. there's nothing until they get money out of politics you got nothing changing it so i mean i don't want to get into politics on this show but yeah it's money it's all about the money go broke. So somebody's <laughs> go woke go broke hey um so somebody asked a question um exercise somebody wants to know your top three tips to fix a slice top three tips for a slice <laughs> uh left-handed or right-handed golfer uh let me think uh, let's give them both. <laughs> I, I literally thought pizza when you said slice. That's so bad. <laughs> well, he was he was talking about it. How he's 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 dropped his golf game. Slingshot. I'm thinking about slingshot. You know that guy always goes like a long arc. <laughs> yeah, most, most common problem in the industry by far. So on your on your takeaway, right-handed. He said right-handed. Right golfer on your takeaway. Really, really focus on trying to take the head. It's usually with the driver trying to take it straight back. And away a lot of people when they go to take it away they pull it in way too quick so try and a pretty low and a really dedicated um backswing when you're at the top i'd like you to or during that backswing as well so that's tip number one really low and wide backswing dedicated number two during that backswing during that um as you're pulling away from the ball try and face Turn the face of the club towards the ground during the initial take takeaway. And then after that, the really common one that I hear from a lot of pros, some people really like it, some people don't, is swing for right or swing down the first baseline. So when you tee up, when you stand up to the ball, when you go to hit it, envision as though you're trying to swing out towards right field or left field down the first baseline of the of a baseball because right most people they come across the ball and their swing path is going left of center and their club face looks like this so you depart a big old slice spin so you want to try and straighten that up right you want your club path to be closer to dead on maybe a little bit heading outwards so to the right or to the first baseman um slow dedicated backswing try and keep that face pointed to the ground as you're pulling away it's funny because my game lasts about 20 seconds when I do exactly that. Because whenever I go in my backswing and I hit that at the putt putt course, I always like knock it out of the park and then my game is over. Like I'm like, fuck it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> I'm sorry. I have no clue what the fuck you guys are talking about when it comes to golf because <laughs> it is the most useless sport to me on the planet. I'm, I know you guys did. You guys like, like when I drop in on a freaking like four foot, five foot wave and it's just perfect and I make my bottom turn. And I mean, that's probably the same feeling you guys get when you hit a really nice freaking whatever drive or whatever, you know, whatever it is. But uh, yeah, when I get my bottom turn and I'm back in and I come off a lip, that's probably the same feeling that that you guys get when you're hitting a good ball. I want to be an expert in this uh, hatchet throwing thing. You see how popular this hatchet throwing, like yeah. everything becomes a sport now. But have you seen where you have like a social? You can have drinks actually, and you can get drunk while you're throwing hatchets. I mean, this yeah. Guy <laughs> Thank you, Mama Rock, for the diamonds and, and the uh, lemons and ice creams. I appreciate it. If you guys want to see a really interesting show on Netflix, Thank watch you. Indian Matchmaker. They literally do this on the first episode where they're, they're hatchet. They're, they go on a date on a hatchet in a hatchet place. Exactly. Really? What it's matchmaker? What are you fucking? Are you fucking kidding me, dude? It, like it, Indian it, with a dot or Indian with a feather? With a dot. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh my God, bro! What do you think? Like. <laughs> It's like, oh, what the freaking hell is that, man? If it's Indian with a feather, I mean, it's different. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's just like, I'm like, Indian matchmaker? Where the heck? I've never even heard of that. I would have heard of that. That's for so sure. I, there's a comedian I follow. His sister, his sister's on, he's on the show. That's how I even know about it. But then it, it's, uh, it's a pretty honest, like, look where, like, some of these guys are like, you know what? Like, it's, it's sort of like a weird thing when you're like, um, um, an immigrant where you're, you got one foot in being a completely Americanized and another foot in your natural culture. And it kind of shows like people are like, well, I've tried the, the American way. Let me try my natural culture way. And so they bring these people that are experts in matchmaking people. And then these people end up finding their spouses. And it's pretty, it's pretty fun. It's pretty interesting actually. And it, they actually have a lower divorce rate in those choices, which is pretty interesting. They have like a 35% divorce rate, which is in, which is in, you know, that's pretty high still, but it's pretty interesting to see that they have a lower divorce rate than people choosing their own mate, which is kind of funny. Well, part of it is the social stigma. Of right. divorce. You know, so it might be pre-selection and things like that. Cause I, you know, again, there's a, a lot of people actually that are in, uh, in Silicon Valley that are uh, Indian descent. And so you'll right. feel families, and uh, some of them are, they were match made in, in their youth and then they moved here and such like that. What, I, what I've noticed is you have social stigma. You know, if you look at the America in the 1950s and 60s, you had social stigma for being a divorcee, you know, for, be, for basically, right. you know, not being inside of a, a, a union and continuing that somehow. So people actually would have the, the families around them might know that that's a very toxic, a terrible relationship. It's really not serving either party for people to continue a relationship, but still the stigma would continue enough that people just stayed together. Um, and so some of these cult cultures are in that way. You stay together, but I don't know if you're happy. I don't know. Yeah. I recommend the show. It's pretty funny. And you'll, you'll get, you'll also, get to everybody out there, choose wisely. Because you're going to have to share your stakes with that person for the rest of your life. Not, not if they don't know my private keys. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Forget it. When you get married, there's no more private, buddy. Mm. <laughs> I know, JK, JK. I know, I know. <laughs> Everybody talks a big ass game until they're sitting in front of their old lady alone in a room and she's asking you some shit. You can talk all the shit you want with your boys. You can say whatever you want. But when it comes down to it, y'all crumble like fucking leaves, man. I'm telling you. I know. I don't know. Yeah, I I know. Like a, a low testosterone thing. I, I think with my testosterone levels, I'm fine. <laughs> you married, Jim? <laughs> I mean, you married, Gary? Uh, I was, but not, not anymore. <laughs> I rest my I, case. I'm definitely not. <laughs> I rest my case. Jim's like, my stakes are mine. <laughs> uh, you ain't married neither, motherfucker, so shut up. <laughs> I said Jim, not me. <laughs> I like, uh, I, I, like I, I love being married. Uh, but, uh, yeah, my persona is definitely – like I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do, you know. If that's a partnership, that's great. Hey, Mama Rock, you're right. He says you sound like a man with much experience there, RG3. Look, I've been married for going on 20 years now, and 
Uh, I know that a happy wife is a happy life. And if mama ain't happy, nobody ain't happy in this house. That's for damn sure. So I, I know my place. I know how to take care of things. And uh, I, I have an awesome wife. So I, I take care of business. That's, that's right, Mama Rock. I, I have experience. And I want to stay married. I don't want to go through the divorce. I don't want my kids putting backpacks on on the weekends. I don't want to deal with all that stuff. You know, So I work very hard to, to stay married. Well, the good thing about a marriage is you can be a specialist as a male, as a masculine person, persona, and do all the things that you enjoy of being a male, but still have partner. And then she can do the same thing. She can be as feminine and uh, do all the things that she might enjoy in her persona, whether it's nurturing persona and things like that. If you're single, the challenge about it is you have to do all those things yourself. You, you basically, you are one person and you don't have that sounding board or that a specialization that a partner might bring to it. So it's yeah. different. And again, it's, I, I think it's, a, again, it's to each individual and how, you know, they, I, I enjoy living my life with my wife. And like you said, having that yin and yang thing going on between the two of us. Some people don't, some people like being alone. You know, I have my best friend who, who passed away this last year. He was just that guy that he didn't need a woman in his life. You know, he was, he was good being alone. He lived on his own and he was a happy, happy man, you know? And I think it's just, you know, to each individual, how they, they want to be, you know? Right. But I'm telling you, if you are, and you're trying to stay married, you, you better, you better take heed. <laughs> well, part of also that thing, like I, I've seen people where over time, they actually 30, 40, 50 years into a relationship, they look almost, the same like the male looks a little female and the female looks a little male and they just basically look like it's the same person times two but uh what i do like is in some ways is when you you want to be attractive to your partner or you want to be attractive to not necessarily to the competition but basically your partner feels you are valuable to them because you are attractive right and in, in general physiology physiologically socially calibrated you know, intellect or whatever, right? You have attractive characteristics. If you continue to polish those, um, your relationship, hopefully, if you're if you're balanced, uh, as as the way you look at your relationship, will flourish. Um, it is people where they kind of take for people for granted. I think that's where you have the breakdown in relationship yeah. stuff. And and you know that's why I, the the show is kind of taking some 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 turns you know i know we play around a lot and we we cuss and we 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 do all the shit we do around here and joke around um but my concern for for the community and and what i'm trying to expose to the community is is the people with wisdom and is the people who are smart who have been through these things and and uh especially when it comes to to money if if, if this turns out the way we all think it's going to turn out and you're an OG hexer and you've got some good stakes and, you know, in the next 10 or 15 years, you're bringing in significant incomes. Um, you need to have your life in order. You need to know, you know, you need to be smart enough with, cause there's a lot of young people out there that are going to come into a lot of money and, um, you, you, you might want to take heed and, and start to set your life up to where, you know, you're going to, you're going to make good decisions because money has a, a way of making us make some really bad fucking decisions, man. I'll tell you that the, some of the worst decisions I've ever made was when I was making good money. I have a question. It's kind of two of those things together. One is we've talked a lot today about healthfulness uh, in general health and because of uh, exercise uh, expertise. The other thing that we bring up on different programs is the staking mechanism of HEX. Um, uh, maybe you guys can cover it again. I was thinking of it like the, the prevention side of things. In health, you think about, I don't want to get so far down that road that I have to have a, a quadruple bypass. I probably should pay attention now, <laughs> you know, before I get down that road. And I wanted to kind of bring that and relate it over to the staking mechanism of HEX. If you have a big payday kind of a day after big payday, your stakes are coming out, right? If a couple of days before, I heard people talking earlier that they uh, on the chats, they're saying, uh, you know, that they had 700,000 staked or maybe whatever. 
and yeah. they were wanted uh, not even steak, just like liquid. They just wanted to hold it to see what VPD happens, and if they're going to stay in, they're going to get out, they're going to stake after the fact or whatever. The two people that comment about this the best is Litecoin comments a lot because he does the math side of things and he looks at those curves a lot. Same thing with RG3. He looks a lot. I wonder if Hexercise has because I haven't heard him really talk about Hex specifically. But what do you guys think about uh, prevention? And I think about that in health, like, you know, prevention, like we talked a lot about health in general uh, and, you know, doing your stake, staking, uh, even if you are staked, early in staking, uh, resetting that stake, looking at the, the uh, you know, the five year plan, you know, the 10 year plan, the, the 15 year plan. How do you look at that? I would like to hear that round table before my battery goes dead if it's possible. Sure. Let, let's let's have Hexercise start because I actually, you're right. We haven't heard him actually talk about how he stakes. So, how, how, so what, what do you think about that exercise? Um, so I think if you're trying to relate it back to the health side of it, uh, RG3 and I, I just mentioned or just kind of noted this the other day is that it, within the Hex community, there's a lot of fitness and health oriented, oriented people. And I think that has to do with their time horizon and their foresight. So because of their willingness to invest and the foresight for the future, number one, they're very invested in their health for an increased quality of life and uh, longevity and hopefully life extension. And number two, the actual framework that Hex has set up is that you have potential for, if it turns into the thing we want it to turn into, your foresight and your investing could set you up really, really well. Um, currently, all of mine is staked. I have it all staked to it's ending in and around the big payday. So kind of going into it and then after it to take advantage of the big payday, as well as right before it kind of insurance policy type of stuff. Um, I think if I had more to put into it, so I kind of out, have allocated what I'm willing to put in there, I would be staking a couple for really, really long term. And I think if there are some developments that I hope to see in the near future, I think I will be creating fairly long stakes and consistent stakes for um, certain like weekly periods or monthly periods that I would have to look into a little, a little closer, but a staking yeah. ladder. Yeah, Something, some sort of ladder that would like kind of set me up with some sort of assistant. Yeah, and like so, um, I recommend that a lot of ladders. But go ahead, RG. Sorry. No, you're. You, there was something I, I I wanted to mention here, and I haven't mentioned it in a long time, and that was um, emergency end staking. Right. And the 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 reason for it. Um, a lot of people, you know, are out there, oh, emergency end stake, your emergency end staking. Thank you for the, for the, for the, um, your interest and all that kind of stuff. But if you've staked, like you said, if you're just before and after a uh, big payday, um, if you have a significant amount in there, you may want to reconsider your stakes because now that you've, you've obviously passed the 50% um, your, your, your 50% time. So you, you, you're losing, if you emergency end stake at this point, after the 50% uh, of time spent staked, then you're only losing interest. You're not losing any of your principal. Your principal is coming right back to you if you emergency end stake. So now some of the, some of the stakes that I, I did the same thing you did. I put, uh, some big ones in, in the beginning, some really big ones. I wanted to realize some gains and get the fuck out and go retire is what I was thinking, right? So I put some big stakes in and then I realized as I looked at um, interest and as I looked at uh, the share price and as I looked at the what Hex was built for and how it was built and why it was built, I go, oops, I made a mistake. And, you know, thank goodness that Richard put the emergency end stake feature in there so that guys like me in year one could go, okay, I made a mistake here. I've learned better. I'm going to, you know, donate the interest to my current stakes and the rest of the pool and remove my, my principal and restake that. And what I did was I built a staking ladder with some of that. And so I built myself a three, oh, so actually it's five years of income of mm -hmm. monthly incomes right? Um, with every three months, I'd give myself a little bonus and then I, I do a, you know, three months. And on the third month, I'd give myself a bonus. I had four bonuses for the year, whatever. 
Um, and so I did a staking ladder that way. I left my stakes in that I put for, um, you know, kids' birthdays, anniversaries, special anniversaries, uh, colleges that I thought my kids were going to be going to college in this year and that, and that kind of thing. So I put some special stakes out there too, some, some, some uh, larger amounts that I wanted to do certain things with. And then um, now I have some stakes that will be at 50% um, here in the next month or so. So I have one more group of, of uh, one more batch of bag of hex that I want to do the same thing. Um, put them, I want to put some out for some 15 year stakes because the value of the 15 year stakes to me is insane. The more and more I look at people who have been doing the math, I'm not a math guy, but I've been watching these guys do the math and I've been watching the share price and what it's going to end up looking like at year five, seven, 10, 15. Of course, just all projections and models, right. but that's where the real value in hex is, is out past five to seven years. When you start hitting that point, that's where the whales are going to be made. That's where the guys that are going to be seeing insane amounts of interest and insane amounts of return on their, on their um, share price. So reversing what I had done in the beginning, my, my mindset, which was a 2017 mindset, you know, being in crypto, um, you know, money, uh, price go up, get out, beat the, try and beat the crash, blah, 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 blah. You know, that mindset was still there until I understand what Richard was doing and what he had tried to create and what the, the he changed, he's changing the whole culture of how you look at crypto and how you get into crypto and what crypto is for. Because I'm telling you guys again, and I say this often, don't think so highly of this thing. Crypto is a store of value. Hex is probably the best store of value in crypto that I've ever seen because of the interest, because of the interest that you make and because of the, the penalties that you, you make. You're actually the bank on a CD. Somebody else is putting a CD in. If they emergency and say you're getting the penalties on it, that's amazing. So having that uh, in crypto is probably the only use case I've seen so far because all this other bullshit, all, all these, these use cases – is crap because if you're in business and you've done any financial um if you've dealt with any banks or anything out there they've already got shit people that works better than crypto i'm sorry but you go use zelle go use zelle right now and look what people are doing with that or what's the other one uh venmo, uh, venmo. they work guys yeah. they're working people are using them by the hundreds of thousands of millions of people are using crypto is not going to be the freaking i'm sorry it, all the other things are working and they're working well so if anybody who all these people these talking heads that are talking about how crypto is going to take over the financial world and and become the dollar and they're going to be able to move it around and bullshit bullshit I agree with that, absolutely because it's uh you're not trying to um, censor the fact that I bought shit at big lots today. And you can't see my, my, my clients sending me money through a Zelle account, my Zelle account. Right. You can see every freaking thing I do on my, on my hex account. You could see the whole thing. You could see if, if you have access to my key to, I mean, uh, to, to, to my address, you can see every stake. You can see every freaking transaction. You can see the whole thing. So my Zelle is a lot better than my my um, hex stakes and my hex address. So, but that doesn't mean go through the moon as far as value because it doesn't. You're you're absolutely right because it's just like anything anything else of value. So I've been getting into these coins lately, coin coins. Like uh, my father left me a ton of coins, so I've been going through them and looking at them, and I mean these are uncirculated, you know, coins that have been around forever that nobody uses anymore, but they hold value and people put value in them. Why? Because there's a, a, a die crack or there's a doubling or there's something, you know, unique about it and people want to buy it. And, and it's the same with baseball cards and it's the same with, you know, fast, old cars and all these other things that people put value in. Crypto will continue to have value. However, for use case, there's nothing better than hex as far as use case goes in all of crypto. I haven't seen anything else that does what hex does. So anyway, my, my, my rant is, is, is over. Um, go ahead. <laughs> like one comment, uh, go ahead. Like one. Hey, so, I, I, I can't tell people what to do 
Hold I on, just... I got to bring this guy on too. This hey, guy. Yeah. He finally hey, decided to do it. He had to come on. He wanted to take his shirt off too for the show. I'm sure. I did, but I got shut down on that idea. Damn it! I thought that was John Cena. Who, your wife? John Cena. Oh, I thought RG didn't want me to take it off. He got all weird about it. Because <laughs> <laughs> you were trying to have a private video conference. That was different. I thought you guys liked the backdrop. I thought I'd go Gary tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Oh my god. I, I, Wanted to jump in. Hey, Hexercise, nice to meet you, man. Hey, thanks, Probably Mama the Rod only for decent, the respectable person on here. Thanks very much. You too. <laughs> Including <laughs> you, fuckface. So what are you talking about? <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> this is a good just... conversation, man, because I, I think there's a lot of value to be had from what you're saying. Um, there's... Crypto's just not at the point where it's going to replace anything a bank does at this point. Let's be honest. I mean, come on, man. I use, I'm use i using Zelle right now, and I, I freaking love it. It's like, holy shit. I give the guy a phone number, and I get my money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like bank. That's like what, that's what square, crypto man. should have been. <laughs> I, and and there's there's no crazy insane freaking fees or worrying where it went or keys to hold and hide and disappear. I mean, it, yeah, it, it's just I'm sorry, crypto, you fucking lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do see people uh, on the beach selling stuff in Puerto Rico. They sell and they use Venmo and uh, yeah. and some other app that goes on a particular bank. So they just do it, you know, it's an instant transaction and it, can, it settles later. It's kind of like second layer. It just settles what is later. It like Banco Popular or whatever. Yeah. Or full of yeah. And all these things like that. So they just basically, they'll sell uh, burritos and, and margaritas and stuff like that, just walking, you know, from place to place on the beach. I got to go over there, man. I really am. The, I know Richard said that knowing Spanish is probably hasn't done too much in his life, but damn, man, you can really do some traveling knowing Spanish. You can really travel on almost all the Americas and get by knowing some well, Spanish. You, it helps you a lot if you're uh, single. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> I'm I'm training. I'm I'm doing the uh, um, the Babel. I've been I've been working on Babel. Nice. Babel. Right. My daughter, she's yeah. really good. She's she yeah. she speaks pretty good. So I'm I'm working on that. But yeah. uh, yeah. Mike was going to talk about stakes. Can you finish? Yeah, yeah, that? stakes, bud. Yeah, about yeah. yeah. Pattern and about early end stakes because I'm in the same position. I, I'm like RG3. I bet, but I bet probably too big um, uh, right around the big payday. And then I had to think about the same thing about what is the value of early end staking and losing interest versus the the setting a share rate. So if you talk about that, that would be great again. Sure. So, um, so I can only talk about what I did, right? And I mean what I'm doing, but um, – I originally was in the boat sort of where I was at 50% of my, of my money in hex was in, was in year one and two, I was staked past big payday. So I was going to get the big payday bonuses so that none of my stakes were coming before big payday, but most of my hex was coming out year one and two. And then slowly what I've been doing is taking it down. Now I'm closer probably to 35% on year one and two because I'm just going to, I'm swinging for the fences. I mean, I'm like, there is a, the risk, there is a risk there that like some people have to take and take that calculation where whether they want, they want some of their hex now, or do they want a lot more later? Marshmallow test. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it froze. Right. And some people are a little shorted now. Uh, am I back? There we go. Yeah, you're back. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So you, you kind of have to choose a point or at least like I think about it in percentages, like how much of your hex that you have staked do you want right now? And how much do you want later? And the, the farther away it is, the more, I mean, the more it is. There's, I've seen people in some of their staking ladders where they have like, it, it kind of goes like this, like more hex now. And then as the years go on, their he the hex they have in their stakes gets smaller and smaller until it's like literally like instead of having like a hundred thousand um, hex stake at one year, it ends up being like 5,000 on year five, five, five. And that's a way to stake it. But I mean, I, the way I went is I went even like after, so I have big stakes for year one and two. And then from there, year three to 15, 
all the same because That's it's just nice. by by not by not basically taking that cash or not taking that hex and you know, now i'm i'm leveraging the fact that i'm i'm swinging right now like you you basically have to decide right now are you are you do you want do you want the hex now or do you are you going to swing the bat and take a chance that it's going to go crazy and mm-hmm. the, math, the math we've done i mean this is this is go off of like Kyle and like Firebun and everything saying this like a ten year stake, pretty much is guaranteed to do an ADX on your principal, a ten year stake. That's not mm-hmm. including that's not including big um, pay uh, what's called um, end stake bonus I mean, end stake penalties. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. that's the real question mark right now in all these calculations. And honestly, to tell you the truth, from what I've seen, all, most I would say about half of the penalties we'll receive in hexes are going to be around big payday. You're going to have people end staking or end staking after big payday, or j- there's going to be a lot of like fudding out. Well, I think you're going to see a lot of people end staking when, when price go up and they're yes. like, so like they got 10 year stakes and they're at the five, six, seven year mark and price right. go up. They're going to be like, man, I could just walk with some, some serious co- coin right now. You know, right. I mean, one of the and- things that if hexologist covers it on a show, I haven't seen his show in a little bit, honestly. Uh, but I know that he ends up talking about the early end stake and, you know, the framing of what you need to look at when you look at that data or when he looks at that data, you need to understand is there are people that are early in staking, but I don't believe that as many as uh, the outsiders might want to FUD might say, oh, look, they're, they're getting out. No, I, you know, I'm getting back in. Back in. <laughs> you're actually getting in deeper is what you're doing. Yeah. You're, mm-hmm. you're, you're emergency end staking to get in deeper. Is yeah. And, and so I, I actually give away to the community. Like you said, if you have a staking ladder and you are early in staking one or two of those rungs, you're actually paying yourself along with the rest of the community with that early in stake penalty. Right. Cause it's good. Right. Just and your to stakes up. too, your stakes too are getting in. So don't, I mean, yeah. that's another part of the equation that people don't realize is that, you know, when you end stake, and it's a, a minuscule amount, but you, you, when you end stake, the stakes that you still have in there are getting your 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 penalty. Absolutely. Right. Mm-hmm. So and I, I look at the fact that I'm buying in, but I'm buying in because I'm paying a penalty and the penalty is going to that community of other stakers, but I'm buying in and I'm buying in at locking a share rate. So it's it's kind of, you know, we we've heard this penny doubled for 30 days thing and how many millions of dollars that is compared to the million dollars offered up front uh, when you do the math of it. And that's 100%, 100%, 100% every day, basically doubling exponentially. So that's not exactly what happens inside of Hex because the share rate, even though we hear that the share rate goes up, you know, as people succeed in uh, a higher ROI, then it goes up higher. So what most of us and I didn't understand for even the longest, um, is even though the share number is going up, it is the compounding effect. So in the future to buy that penny doubling or to buy that percentage of exponentiality, um, it gets more expensive to buy that rung or that exponentiality. So the cheapest that you can get on your exponentiality potential right now uh, is right now. (laughs) Right now, and tomorrow it will be right now again and tomorrow right now. So your opportunity is continuing but if you're going to do it, do it now. It's kind of my, yeah. my philosophy. Because so it's me, closing me. and it's closed. The, the window is closing, but it's closing slower right. during the, the launch phase. After launch phase, yeah. it's going to close much quicker. Well, the, the door basically slams shut on, yeah. on big payday. And the, 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 win, the window is very small at that point. And then it, right. it just it gets worse and worse and worse as time goes on. I, I'll say, I, we're going to see volatility in general, but people will see the number on the chart and think that that's the volatility. The volatility that I don't think will get as much commentary. It'll get commentary between us, between Richard and people like that will comment on the share rate. Did you see what the, happened to the share rate? What How cheap the share rate used to be uh, 24 hours ago? So you're going to see volatility in the share rate and the number that the general public outside of this community will uh, see is they'll say, oh, look, people, they they got big payday. They doubled their stack and then they sold or they traded on Uniswap or whatever. And look at that volatility of Hex. Oh, my God. See, these guys all screwed yeah. up. Over there. So I think I- there's another thing that's going to happen too, Jim, that's going to counter that a little bit. And that is that there are going to be people that are either weren't smart enough 
didn't know about it or were too afraid to emergency end stake like we are doing at this point to spread out and they will take their doubling and they're planning on staking out further at that point. Yeah. So right. You're going to have people that realize these early hex gains and these early um, matured stakes and they're going to restake those. And it's going to be to the detriment because the share price is going to be exponentially different at that point, um, you know, after big payday. But they're going to, I think we're going to see a lot of people realizing the value of staking and they're going to go, oh shit, well, I need to put a bunch of this. Well, out because this thing, if you ever gone to Vegas, this idea that you're going to play with house money. Oh, once I've won and I'm now got house money. I'll keep my money and I'll just play with house money. So I think that at the big payday, people will think, oh, now I, because of the big payday bonus, mm -hmm. now I have more and I'll just yeah. sell half and I'll stake the rest yep. uh, for profit. So they're going to look at that thing and that may happen. You may people, and again, I want people that realize profit to be applauded, not, yep. not be called fools. Say, oh, wow, you could have had this other thing. Oh, you only made X, uh, X ROI. Well, you made XRI. Congratulations to you. Celebrate you because that's also part of the reason people in the future will look at Hex and look at the past and they look at old videos like this and they say, oh, you know, I should have got in way back then. But since I missed it, I need to look at for some other stupid project uh, that's going to steal my money. Uh, so I like yeah. the Hex thing. And I think we should applaud people when they have their profit, um, even, even, in, even though he doesn't like to say trading. But even if they're trading and their profit... I don't really see that as negatively as I used to. Right. But so let me, let me say one thing about the share rate at least. So I've taken, I've emergency unstaked some stake for, for a, a one year stake and then took that and evenly distributed between year one to 15 and 15 is five, 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 obviously. Right. And what I've done to my share rate is I have multiplied the amount of shares I've had from, let's just say it was, um, I basically increased my shares by 2.8 times my shares by staking it that long, evenly. Right. Right? Right. Compounding. What's, going happen, what's going to happen after big payday is I could do the same thing. Let's just say I double my I double my hex and then I, I stake it out. It, it I might only double my shares by like 1.8 because of the increased share rate instead of the 2.8. Or it might be like 1.5x my yeah. shares. My emergency end stakes were 10% and they ended up in an extra 30%. So I gained 20% uh, by restaking. So huge gains, huge gains. Yeah. And those stakes and those stakes and that's just in instantaneous value that I can see now. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about future share price and what the 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 exponential growth is going to be. And all yeah. of that compounding of the interest and whatnot. I mean, that's that that that's even that even multiplies it even more. I'm just talking about yeah. in sheer what I got for for moving it out, you know, uh, for right. big payday bonus and all that. It's it it I made oh, oh, you know twenty percent more by taking two, my two stakes that I took out and moving them out. Yeah. So I mean, freaking huge. It's huge. Have you guys have you guys taken the time? I was thinking about this the other day. You guys taking the time to think about the dichotomy of whether you want people to stake longer and the price go up or less people staking and price doesn't go up, but you get more percentage of the six <laughs> nine percent every year. So I was trying to calculate that the other day and I, I think the value is still in a greater number of the network staking and the price going up exponentially, even though your your percentage of the 3.69% inflation every year won't be as high. Because currently right now we're we're about 22%. I'd like to see it stay like that and slowly uh, gain value. Yeah. Continuously slowly, gain value, but but slowly yeah. gain value. I'd like and to us see that. Take, and us all of us staker class, the sixteen percent currently staked be the ones that get all the inflation. Well, your whales, your 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 year one people are going to be your whales. Your year one people are going to get the biggest benefit, um, but then the product is going to be um, gr exponentially greater for all um, because of. I mean, y there's nowhere anywhere where you can get 
3.69% interest. And, right. you know, so, so having that product available and having a steady price increase, I mean, it's just going to be better for everybody, better for everybody. The, the staker class in year one, of course, they're going to be the wells. They're going to be the benefits. They're the benefactors of the whole program, and it's duly deserved. Right. Everybody who yeah. worked hard in Hex in the first year, supported it, uh, got involved, did the things that believed we're all doing. In they it all enough did. to stake long. What's got that? Shit, got believed in it long. Believed in it enough to stake long. Exactly. And those like some of those big whales that staked, you know, ten years, uh, you know, billion Hex and all that. Those guys deserve to be. Big fat whales. I mean, they believed in the project in the beginning. You know, they well, brought well, attention to it. I wanted to say something about uh, you know. Again, I only got about halfway through Richard's stream, which is, again, every time that I go through any of his content and I recycle or re revisit stuff, uh, you can just find more and more gems in general. So this isn't only praise about him specifically, uh, but what it is is about if you're going to launch something, right? You're going to basically put your own money into it and maybe. Uh, go bust because you had an idea and your idea didn't work out. That's you on you, right? That's the, you, you, you build something yourself. The money was on the table. It got lost because it didn't work out. Okay. That's just the ups and downs about entrepreneurism in general, right? It's on you. But the conscious effort that Richard made for a couple of years, actually, many people don't know how delayed this project had been before it ever got to launch period. Uh, in December of 19, it was it was constantly being talked about inside of Telegram uh, rooms, mm -hmm. community contribution, mathematics. I mean, the depth of the mathematics that were discussed in public before there were separate channels talking about the development of the actual uh, software. That was amazing. Uh, and it lost a lot of people constantly that didn't look at the math. But I see other projects, and again, with the heating up of the, uh, the, 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 the DeFi market, the new ICO craze, whatever's going to happen over the next uh, year or so, kind of like the pre-stuff of 2017, I see a lot of hype, and I see a lot of clones, and I see a lot of, well, you know, everything was great except for this one thing that we're going to change. And yeah, we'll get it still audited by this other same company that's sort of similar, but it doesn't mean that they're going to execute necessarily the what the auditors say to do, right? The audit just tells you what you should address. But do you have the knowledge base? Do you have the experience? Do you have the community of other IT professionals in general that look at constantly security? So I wanted to praise specifically the fact that Hex could have launched earlier, way earlier, and had mm -hmm. some vulnerabilities. And those vulnerabilities might say, well, that just is going to go along with the fact that we're going to be a beta. This is going to be a beta, and it's a risk. It's an experiment. All the caveats that companies end up saying or people end up saying when they launch their own crypto thing, they say, well, you know, it's an experiment. If it goes bust, hey, you know, no, no, no harm, no foul, because that's crypto. Fuck that shit. That's not crypto. That's someone's 15 years of their potential pen, uh, potential pension, their potential retirement, the things that they're planning for their kids or for their graduation. You know, when RG talks about laying out these stakes and ladders, he's talking about family things, he's talking about emotional things, he's talking about purpose. And that's completely different than saying, oh, I'm just going to throw 50 bucks on the roulette table on uh, green and see if it hits. That's completely different about the speculation game of crypto up until today. Yep. And I wanted to praise specifically Richard under our pressure. I remember urging for this shit to get out. I was like, what the hell? We've been talking about this delay another five weeks, another four weeks. I'm not, what? What? We've been hearing four weeks for months. What's this fucking four week yeah. thing, right? Just if you're going to do it, just do it. Get shit or get off the pot. I was thinking that back then. But when you look at the recognition, uh, all of the one from his own pseudo supporters at that time, hey, man, just launch it. I am glad he didn't. And I look at the security vulnerabilities and risks that some of these other things that are launching now or launching very soon. I hope that it works out for them. I hope they really did do all these things that Richard definitely did as a as a leader in the space, bringing things like before Uniswap existed, before opportunities for pump and dump on Uniswap, uh, ERC kind of stuff that launches constantly now. So I really admire that Richard thought about the tens of thousands, maybe millions of people eventually that stake hex and think about the, what's going to happen in five years, what's going to happen in 15 years. You know that this thing was originally supposed to be a 50 year CD. Did you know mm -hmm. that? 
it was going to be 50 years. And the only reason that it's not 50, 50 years is because of Ethereum. Because of Ethereum, stupid ass. <laughs> yeah. So it's amazing the, 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 the forethought, the probably sleepless and tireless nights of just thinking about the game theory. How is this going to work with exchanges? Why would they onboard uh, people, uh, this coin into exchanges when it doesn't serve their interest of trading? This product doesn't serve the interest of trading specifically. It's not designed to at least. So kudos to Richard for what he actually went through from even the pseudo supporters back then that now we're kind of uh, uh, disciples of a sort. Um, it's very it's very interesting. I, I admire his uh, fortitude. Yeah, no, and, and something you mentioned, you know, I, I looked at this project as – it, it, different than any other crypto that, that I've looked at. As soon as I learned at what he was doing and how he built the CD and how he built the interest, the trustless interest into it, I said, wow, that's really why I even got involved in crypto in the first place. Of course, mm -hmm. I wanted it to be hacks back then, but it wasn't. It was ICOs and, you know, throwing dropping 50 on the roulette table, like you said. You know, that's what 2017 was all about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and people were cashing in and people were getting wrecked and people were, you know, held on for dear life until it just freaking, you know, crashed into the burned. And, you know, some of us stuck around. Um, but I was actually able, like, visions. And, and of course, you know, it's like I said, I've, I've only ever allowed crypto to be, you know, like 10% of my portfolio period into story. That's, that's what I was willing to risk in it. And of course I've got my, you know, the, the other uh, things that I've, you know, supplied for my family outside of crypto, but it allowed me to look at it in that same way that I looked at my other investments um, as solid, like, okay, well I can put some money in here for my kids college. Okay. I can put my money in here for my, my wife's and mine's 25th anniversary and our 50th anniversary, you know, and things like that, or, you know, a family trip I want to have, uh, let's do every year. Let's have some type of family gathering. You know, I started doing things like that because I was that confident that hex was at, had actually built something that I can do that with, you know, like if I was going to a bank and saying, okay, I want to get a CD and create these things for, you know, my financial uh, health later on down the road. You know, I was able to look at Hex that way because of how confident I was in what Richard did. And guess what, guys? Here we are, what, uh, nine months later? Are we, what are we, nine months? Mm -hmm. Here we are nine months later, no downtime, no bugs, nothing wrong. Richard's still standing there with his chest out going, come on, motherfuckers, come get me. Come get me. Bring it. Tell me something's wrong. It ain't wrong. You guys are wrong. I'll take the top guy in crypto and sit down and debate him. He he called him out and said, come on, let's talk. Andreas. Andreas Antonopoulos. <laughs> and everybody has respect for Andreas. We all have respect for Andreas. I have respect for Andreas. But Richard said, bring it. Because because Andreas doesn't even believe in the project. Andreas, he's yep. even saying shit about the project. I told Andreas on Twitter not to debate him. I told him, you'll lose, but at least you'll get more eyes. <laughs> you'll, yeah. get, you'll get more people following you. Dude, he'll crack reality, you know, from what I've heard, Andreas is wrecked anyway. I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know for a fact. But, I mean, the poor guy ended yeah, he, up. He got a, a million dollars in Bitcoin donated to him because he was – the evangelist for Bitcoin and didn't own any. Yeah. I mean, again, uh, Richard just said it the other day again, he said it before, but you know, someone was saying that they wanted to go to college to study, a, a, uh, to be a, a, an economist and what should they look at as far as macro right. stuff that's going to impact them. And he said, don't do that. Learn, learn marketing, learn salesmanship. And don't, how many wealthy economists do you know? I mean, <laughs> how many do you know? <laughs> no. Is that correct? So I'm gonna let you guys go. I'm, gonna, oh, I'm glad you can come in and lay around and hang out with us. Yeah, man. I thought I'd show you guys off the six pack real quick here <laughs> before I go. <laughs> but, uh, is that that laser thing where they they would you was that paint that on before you got here? Is that what happened? It's 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 mascara, bro. Next time you do that, you make sure you get a tan. All right, you just fucking hurt. I my know. Mind. I know my back is super tan, but 
the sun only shines on the back, man. It never gets that stomach. I well, you got to quit laying it. on your stomach all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to comment. It's good talking to you guys. We'll catch right, you on bro, the good seeing you, guys. man. Yeah. We'll see you guys. Later. Pretty good. Who the fuck invited that guy? <laughs> he was he was a little. I think he had a few Bud Lights too. <laughs> that that is crazy though. Like doing the math on like ten thousand hex staked at ten years is like low end eight hundred k hex. That's not including penalties at all, dude. Somebody. Uh, was that you that put the 10k in there? 10k at yeah. five 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 will be around 1.6 to three million hex, right? Yeah, that's the low end. The AI of uh, Sweden or wherever he is, but he put his uh, three million at the uh, five five five. I was like, fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> I like he's an advocate, but I'm like, god damn. Can you talk about my boy Adrian? Come on <laughs> now. I'm gonna put him out, bro. Watch. What's that? I'm gonna put him out to get that steak out of here. <laughs> hey, he commented. He commented on um, on uh, what do you call it on uh, Spanking Hex's uh, Twitter. Right, right, right. Yeah, he he commented on Spanking Hex's Twitter. All right, yeah, Spanking Hex. <sighs> so I've seen him comment on Hexos and Spanking Hex. He he still hasn't said anything to me, but that's yeah. Right. He's funny. I like him. Yeah. And- what the guy, um, what's the guy the, the guy that made uh, Bitcoin Cash? Roger Ver, right? Ver. Dude, Roger Ver bodied and- Andreas, dude. Holy shit, dude. Like, he was, like, bullying him mean, on Twitter and everything. Basically saying, why the fuck aren't you rich? Like, <laughs> why are you not rich? It's like $300. That's it. $300 fucking dollars. That's all you had to hold in Bitcoin. And you'd be good. Like, you were in just around the same time I was. That's he he did the math on him and he was just like, damn, bro. And then um then he got the donations for it and stuff, which you know, cool. But like he dude, that was damn man, that was that I mean, was someone yeah. even when he got involved, you know, Bitcoin Jesus, right? The whole uh the whole Roger Veer character. I mean, he really put himself out there. I mean, he was he was successful before Bitcoin. So a lot of people think that these OGs yeah, um, they were. That they, that they just were in the right place at the right time. They, they, you know, the lottery ticket just was cashed in for them, and now they have such bags that they can flaunt it. That is not what Roger Veer was. That is yeah. not. I mean, he wasn't even somebody that uh, got it from exchanging and things like that. As far as tradership, um, he put his time, which yeah. is the most precious resource any of us has, into evangelizing. And you think about someone like Andreas. I'm not bashing Andreas. But to evangelize and be paid to do it, he was being paid to be compens- uh, to be on stage and his right. his, um, his uh, trans- transportation and you know advocacy had use. Um, but it, he not to have bought three hundred dollars worth and just held it. If you believe in the technology, then just believe in the technology. What's three hundred dollars to have done? Yeah, and only three hundred dollars in hex in right. December. Yeah. I got more than that, though. I mean, sometimes I think about that. Like, am I wrecking myself by calling myself Hex Jesus? Like, <laughs> oh my God damn it. Nah. I got mistakes, so there's nothing I can do, dude. I mean, really, I'm I'm locked in, bro. Like, I, I'm in this bitch, so let's go. <laughs> we all are. So, Hexercise, you got anything else to add? You, We've been talking over you the whole time here. Um. No, a uh, big fan of Roger Veer. I think he's got good intentions for the most part. I think he's wish he was still on like the Bitcoin team, but like I don't. Again, I'm not technical enough to really understand his problem with the big block versus small block debate. Um, yeah, he just tried to make Bitcoin better. That's all. Yeah, and 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 he made it better in the wrong direction. You know, it was like. I wouldn't say that necessarily. I mean, again, you get into the whole tribalism side, but uh, well, I don't think that the direction that he he took it did any ha- had any effect. I mean, what's bigger block size doing? Uh, well, all, almost all of the innovation we just talked about at the beginning of the show. It, it, yeah, innovation of what crypto, which is shit. It bigger block size doesn't help it beat freaking um, you know Zell. It's not going to beat Zell. I don't care yeah. how big your BC Bitcoin Cash is. It's still not beating Zell. So yeah, that, it doesn't have to beat Zelle. It beats Bitcoin. 
Well, it it, it it does and it doesn't because it was about marketing. Really, nobody gives a shit about blockchain. Can you can you again? I'm not I'm not a Bitcoin cash. I have no no dog in this fight as far right. as Bitcoin. I I actually traded away my Bitcoin for hex, so I don't have anything. At the top, baby. At I don't have top. anything but hex, and um, and and that was a significant amount of Bitcoin uh, to do it. Um, but I committed, and what I see is again, Roger is similar to uh, Richard in a lot of ways because they both advocate utility. What is the function of, what's the reality of uh, the crypto space? Exactly. The function and the intention might be one thing. Okay, it's gonna be peer-to-peer -peer cash. No, it's not. Uh, it's gonna be a uh, store of value, uh, sort of. I mean, it, had, it went down to 3,300 bucks, went to 20 grand. Okay, uh, is that storing value? I don't know. So you kind of go through those things as it morphs into whatever is gonna be on the next narrative world computer, all the things that we've all heard, if you've heard any of Richard's stuff, but it's truth in a lot of ways. And what Roger talks about is similar to Tim Draper. Tim Draper, every time that I've seen him talk on stage or whatever, it has been about the utility. Yes, he's Bitcoin. Yes, he has Bitcoin, but him and, and his son, Adam, are about the, what is the function and utility of this? Maybe there will be four or 500 tokens, but there's going to be a... a one that has the most efficiency, the most delivery uh, of uh, value to the consumer, just like in anything in a marketplace. You're going to sort that out through voting of dollars or whatever you're calling money um, or currency. So I see that both Roger and uh, uh, Richard talk about you want it secure. You want no central middleman. You, you said you wanted to replace banks. You wanted to have anonymity. You wanted to have throughput. All of those things on Hex and many of those things on Bitcoin Cash have happened. Hex in only nine months. I mean, we have all of those things. We have anonymity. We have throughput with uh, ZK uh, rollups and stuff. The start, uh, yeah. All this stuff. It's very yeah. amazing. Yeah. No, you're right. No, you're, you're definitely right about that. Um, yeah, let me see. I have a question for exercise. What, what do you think about the carnivore diet? That's a good question. Like, <laughs> if it's again, I'm mostly a diet agnostic. If it works for the person, the best diet is one that someone can adhere to. It's very similar to a training program. As long as you're getting like all of your nutritional value or all your nutritional needs, and it works best for you, go for it. If you're gonna claim that it's the best diet ever period well there's just no evidence for almost any diet out there it, until it comes to like a performance context in most yeah. performance contexts we've got it nailed down pretty much but carnivore diet yeah lots of like it's pretty bit pretty popular in the crypto space people like posting pictures of steaks and saying that all they eat is steak <laughs> and how cool they are because all they eat is steak and they I don't, I, mean, believe, I, don't feel believe, good. I don't believe the Bitcoin is with this carnivore diet, dude. These are some skinny fucks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, <holy. laughs> well, you know what? That, there's there uh, again. It's all about your body, your right. age, and where you're at. Like a baby, for instance, a baby. You could feed a baby milk, and the baby grows and develops, and and it's only eating one thing because of the hormones that are in that baby at that time. What the brain is doing, and what the hormones are doing. The growth hormone is going crazy on that baby, and it's helping it to develop. Now, an old fifty-three year old guy like me, my my hormones aren't working like that. So I need to make sure that I'm supplementing properly with nutrition, because the body's going to stop working if I'm just drinking milk all day long. It ain't going to work like a baby anymore, you know. So there's there's things to be said about every individual, every person, uh, where they're at in their age, where they're at in their time frame in life, and and you have to adjust your diet properly. So for uh, the whole carnivore thing, sure, have at it. If it works for you, if it helps you to lose weight or you feel great on it, you know, have at it, but there's something to be said about putting proper nutrition in your body too. And just putting protein in your body and the creatine and all the things that are in steak, I, I don't think is giving you everything that you need. You better be supplementing really well. If you want to lose weight, the best diet is don't buy anything. Don't <laughs> buy. Be, be a broke, be a wreck motherfucker. You got a panhandle bag, walk through people's backyard and eat the fruit off their tree. If you, you know, catch, you know, wild animals. 
you're going to, you know, if you've got to outrun a rabbit, you got to be lean and fit to do that, right? So I just say, if you really want to lose weight, don't buy anything. Just get it other ways. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Panhandle for a year. <laughs> Panhandle for, commit. Say, this is my fitness program. I'm oh, going to Panhandle for a year. <laughs> right on. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna shut the stream down. We've been going. We're losing viewers, and uh, everyone's getting tired. Thanks, exercise, for coming on. We appreciate you, G uh, Gary. Thanks for coming on and hanging out with us. Always appreciate you and your knowledge and and uh, your take on health and all that. So, thanks, guys. We'll catch you all on the next one. And uh, the next one is the F and Hangout. I'm hoping I'm gonna be here because I'm getting ready to go out of town. But I, I think I'll no, I'll be here for Friday. I'm not leaving until Sunday. I'm leaving tomorrow, and then I'm leaving Sunday again. So I'll be here for Friday night, and uh, I think Friday night's going to be fun. I got some. I got some stuff. Thanks again, everybody, for the diamonds, Mama Rock. Thank you for those last diamonds and uh, Hexican Sweat. Thank you. Just donated another diamond. Appreciate all you guys. We'll catch you next time on Discord. Okay. Thank you.